the school committee, I will ask that you stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, I will run through our agenda quickly, and um, Jennifer Devlin will be joining us a few minutes late, and we will just get going. So we'll start off with recognitions, followed by our first opportunity for public comment. We have um, three reports to the school committee, the liaison reports, school committee chair report, and the superintendent's report. Under new business, we will discuss the athletic fields permitting and get a project update from Kathy Herbel of Gale Associates. We will um, talk about the co cross-country course completion of phase one. We have a final travel field trip request, um, a request for an additional English, English language learner teacher. Uh, we'll have a discussion about, um, about starting our superintendent search, and then we have uh, two policies, one under new business and one under old business. After that, we'll have our final public comment section and items by consensus, and we have no executive session today. So all that being said, I will turn it right over to you, and we can get started. Well, I see that we have a couple of individuals in our audience tonight that I actually wanted to invite up. Um, Tim Person and Don Freiberg, if you could just come on up so we could get a picture of you. Um, you can just stand over here with Kathy, I think, would be perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, and I'll just let you stand up while I try to my best to embarrass you. <laughs> um, so Tim Person, as, as you all know, is our new Director of Buildings and Grounds. And Don Freiberg, Don, you've been with us for many years, yes, uh, maintenance supervisor. Mm -hmm. And how, how long have you been with us? Uh, since 2001. Yeah. Wow. So this is long overdue. I, when, we do, when we do recognitions, you know, we're often bringing students in here and, and people who have made co significant contributions and just, just things that we want to point out. And I just wanted to recognize both of you tonight because the numbers of people who have been contacting the school committee and our office just noting the things that have been going on um, under your direction over the summer, over the hot summer, um, but also the teachers and the administrators in the building. So we're talking about outside as well as inside, just the, the condition of our schools. Uh, it makes all of us feel just really proud and small things like when you walk into the middle school, which is you know something that people had said man did you did you see that I know Don you and your crew <laughs> yeah, you know right, worked on that crew, yeah. didn't you design the, yeah, the new Mike, grasses yeah, there Mike's echo. yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. guys, he, he laid it all out Mike Zecco you said sorry yeah. I was talking so we couldn't yeah. hear his name yeah. yeah and those are the kinds of things that it just when you when you feel that people that are working like like you mm -hmm. are for for the district really care about their work and it, it just feels really wonderful um, so I know that probably school committee also has something to say but I just wanted to take the chance to have you come tonight and recognize the hard hard work that you did and do all year long um, but all summer long while everybody's enjoying the summer and you're getting the schools and the grounds ready for for our start and I just think it really deserves to be called out so thank you so much Does anybody have anything they want to add? It, it just to echo that everything really looks beautiful. Yeah. In and out. I, I just would like to say that my guys in my uh, in the shop in my uh, department has been working very hard to get everything done. They, yeah. they deserve a lot of credit too. Yeah. They, they absolutely. Have been, they've uh, they've uh, really stepped it up. Yeah. They've been you know easily uh, easily accessible to some of the changes that we put yeah. in place, and, yeah. and uh, I think really kind of given a good attitude about. You know, moving forward and, mm -hmm. and making our schools look great. Right, right, you know? yeah. so, well, inside we and out, that. they mm -hmm. all look spectacular. The grounds, in particular, just looked so good. I know we got more rain this summer, but it, they just look great. I love the new bench in front of the high school. Mm -hmm. How you did that? That just looks so cleaned up and fresh and nice. And even when we were in the center school on the first day of school, that building that's celebrating its 90th birthday looks really really good for its age and um, so <laughs> maybe you have a future career you know in makeovers or something but, you know, but just really I, everywhere I've been um, you know in the last couple of weeks has just looked 
spectacular, all ready for everybody to come back. So thank you. It was obviously you took a lot of care with it. So well, we, we appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I just I'm just gonna shake your hands. <laughs> 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 thanks, Don. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Great. And thanks for coming out. You're welcome to stay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we know that you probably have some building to take care of. Oh, <laughs> so. watch the Patriots. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, 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 this is right. oh, the real reason. That's why no one's watching us tonight. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you, guys. Um, well, that was very nice. Are there any other recognitions? All right, I just wanted to quickly say congratulate Dr. McLeod on a really successful opening. Um, I was able to go to a couple of the schools with you and the message that you gave was just great this year and um, really well received. Just, um, I won't repeat all of it because I forgot one of the three things that you <laughs> did, but, um, but she just started out basically easing the tension by saying what I'm not going to talk to you about this year are test scores and school committee policy and other things like that and it really the focus was just on um, on students and um, their their the way that they all are role models for the kids and just a very very thoughtful opening and it was really Thank really you. received and I I'm sad to say that I know it's your last one, but you really hit it out of the park so congratulations thank you. Thank you, Jean. Um, and thank you for that so can move into public comment if anybody is here from the public and would like to say anything. All right. Um, so then why don't we get right into the liaison reports and I will just say for all of you that I know Jennifer does have a report to give about the center school reuse so we'll go back to that when she gets here. Um, but while we're waiting do you want to start with your CPAC? Sure. I'll start with the CPAC. So you guys may remember back in April we looked at a policy for ESY, which is the extended school year program, and decided after reading through it not to take action until it had gone back through a, a subcommittee to look at ESY, to look at the guidelines. So the subcommittee met with Karen Zaleski and some of the staff from ESY and some CPAC parents. We met four times over the summer. We are almost done with the policy, the, sorry, the procedural. Um, handbook and looking forward to them coming. Is it the next school committee meeting or the? It is. In, okay. Oh, sorry. To, we did. We give no. At the beginning October, of October. That's right. Because of their September nineteenth. That's right. Yep. That's right. So to bring that back for review here at that point. So that's to be continued. So. Does it, anybody else have updates? We can talk about the athletic fields a little bit, although we're going to talk more about it. Yeah, I mean, um, from a elementary school building committee perspective, no, um, no significant update um, since we last met. Um, probably since the last time we were on television, there have been a ton of significant updates, but you can see most of them if you drive by. Um, the the project is continuing. Um, the the progress has been great. It, everything is continues to be on time. Um, we certainly had our share of rain this summer, but um, that did not exceed any of the contingencies that they had built into the schedule to this point. Um, the exterior work, the exterior facing work is almost at its completion. Um, they've been, begun installing the windows um, and just every time, I, I know every time I drive by it, it looks more and more like a building, um, which we got to see the inside of when we got our, our tour. So. Um, so I feel like at this point it's sort of a, a no news is good news thing about the uh, <laughs> about that building and, and its progress. So, cool. so Jean, on the community communications front, uh, Dr. McLeod and I met with um, the HPTA representatives and also the Diversity Alliance, and you know we're still doing some groundwork before we can bring something back substantial to the school committee. We hope we'll have something for the next meeting. Oh, great. Okay. And uh, we will talk more about the athletic field subcommittee um, work when um, we have Kathy Herbal with us from Gale. But I will just say we are going to go visit. We're going to do site visits for um, to look at different types of infill. Uh, we'll be doing that next week, so we'll be able to um, include that in our next report. And we also will include that kind of evaluation in the um, in one of the upcoming public forums. So other than that, I think we'll probably cover the rest of it when we get to that agenda item. Um, so unless anybody has another one, I'll, I'll move into my chair report. And I do need to announce the results of our executive session um, at, from our August meeting. So we had a, an executive session to review minutes and documents. 
Um, and so at our August 14th school committee executive session, the school committee voted to accept and release the executive se session minutes from May 11th, 2017. We also reviewed all backup documentation from 2016 through 2017 and voted to release all backup materials, including Article 4, MOA, MOU Educator Evaluation Process and Procedures, MOU Professional Development, Ralph Dumas Retirement Spreadsheet, Salary Grill Work for FY 2018, Tech Salary Survey, Administrative Staff, um, Administrative Salary Grid Work, Tech Salary Survey for Superintendents. Um, so and that was that's all that we did there. And then I also received an invitation from Senator Spilka's office um, that I wanted to extend to any of you, well, any two of us who are interested so that, because they are not gonna post meetings. Um, Senator Spilka, this is in your packet, Senator Spilka is hosting a social emotional lear learning working lunch at the <coughs> State House. Um, so the purpose is to learn more about social emotional learning issues and also um, networking for school committee members. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's Tuesday, September 19th from 11 to one. Um, so I can respond tomorrow with whomever is interested and available um, to go. Is, uh, does anybody want to go? I'd love to, but I'll be out of town. That would make it hard. I have a conflicting meeting. Okay. Mina, are you interested or available? I'm interested, but I have a commitment at the senior center, which okay. I can't get out of. Okay. Sorry. I will, um, I will plan to go, and I'll just ask Jennifer if she wants to go that day. She can go with me. Very good. Um, and then the other piece of business in my report is, it was also in your packet, but it's time to fill out our annual disclosure by non-elected municipal employee forms. So if you can all um, just fill these out, either you can drop them off at the town clerk's office, or if you want to get them back to me, I can take them over one time during the day. So this is of uh, for conflict with regard to any of the work that we do? Yes, and particularly, okay. typically it's um, whatever fees are going to be applying to this us. This is the right one. Isn't it? No, it's not elected. Oh, this isn't uh, the right and, one. And You're right. Until I pulled it up here, too, I, I had right. looked at it before Good and catch. didn't notice myself. I, but, yeah. All right, well, we're going to fill out a similar form that we'll be sending <laughs> to you. Oh, so, Nina, that's why you were asking about it. Well, it's right. funny because this is the actual one that the town clerk handed to me. Okay. So, appointing authority. Yep. No, you're right. So I'll get the right one and send it out, but it's that time of year. So we'll just get that taken care of before our next meeting. Um, so that's all that I had, and I can turn it over to you. Okay. Um, so again, the, oh, we did. We had a, a really um, wonderful opening of school, really smooth. I think teachers' uh, feedback from the first two days of, of teacher uh, professional development is that they just really enjoy having or appreciate having two days back to back like mm -hmm. that. It's very, it provides a really strong beginning um, for our staff to come together, for our new teachers to get a feeling. Um, we get to really complete some things that we take on that often with just a short little professional development day you can't. And when it's up against also the opening of school, mandated trainings that teachers have to completing, complete, just those, um, the nuts and bolts of opening school that have to take place, that can consume everyone's time. So um, that it is very much appreciated, and we've done it now. I think this is the third year that we've done it, and, and it's really a, a really great model. Um, and I think the model now that this is our second year opening before Labor Day? Yes. Or third, yes. second. Okay. Second. It's also, I think, really appreciated by the people, by the families, where kids can come for two full days kind of get back into that routine of getting up and getting through a school day. And then everybody looks forward to that four days of, okay, final final weekend of summer. And um, But then when they start after the long re weekend, it just feels like everyone's down to business. And that's exactly how it's felt. I don't know. I'm seeing nodding of heads. Um, so yeah. I was, I was just, I was gonna actually say the same thing in commentary. I think the feedback that I've gotten from people um, 
<laughs> including my kids, um, <laughs> are that that they that everybody really feels good about that arrangement of having those two days for the students back, um, and then have the long weekend. It's an opportunity to get back, get going, yeah. but then have a little bit of a, a, a break to start. And right. I know we also reap the benefits of it on the other side in June. Yeah. So yeah, right, right. So that that was wonderful. We just uh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. We describe it as the soft opening, like a restaurant. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, the and soft the, opening. This was the real yeah. opening. <laughs> I like it. Down to business. That, that's really great. One of the things that, that I have to uh, call out that contributed to the smooth opening is the um, brilliant suggestion that Susan and Tim came up with on the new traffic pattern. I mean, you all were involved in a lengthy two-hour-plus discussion about solutions. Um, we've worked closely with the town on the traffic calming over a couple of years now. And nobody had thought of trying the solution that in, ended up being what we think is a short-term solution because we will be coming back to you about ideas about something that will be more of a longer term. Um, but I think sometimes some new eyes can just have a fresh look at things and having not actually seen what it looks like to pick up and drop off kids. <laughs> they looked at this at kind of um, the road and thought, well, why wouldn't you just have the kids go out the back door and pick them up there and we thought not sure <laughs> why not um, but but I was really quite surprised at how honestly um, few people we heard from um, I don't know it, since I didn't hear from any of you I didn't assume that you were hearing complaints about I haven't seen it because I might have managed to have my kids on the, on bus. the bus. <laughs> I, I will say that in addition to everyone you just called out, but also I think what was a big help was um, the work that the DPW did yes, um, in terms of definitely. the signage, oh. the cone. I mean, not only do they physically not have the option to queue up, but it was out there so early <laughs> right. that anybody driving past the school before school was reminded of it, so you didn't sort of blankly show True. up there on, in the morning. Um, so I think that that helped a great deal too. Um, I, I did not hear any complaints about no. the new the new traffic pattern. No. So. And it was a very big change. So for yeah. something that is as big a change and, and so entrenched in people's morning routine when they're not really quite awake, right, um, I think, and Susan and I were just chatting about it today in terms of, you know, just also, you know, Phil Powers helping us out mm -hmm. with, the, with the directing of the traffic. Um, Paul, who everybody loves and trusts, if Paul says to do it, they're just going to do it, right? Um, and so I think all of our all of the contributors that took place in having a solution to a problem it, is something to be commended. So thank you. Thanks. Um, and then, oh, I was going to have the number for you and I was so busy looking at our new enrollments that I can't tell you how many we welcome back. But we welcome back 3,600 students anyway plus. Um, and yeah, and um, you know, seeing lots of smiling faces and excited kids and everybody I've spoken with that I've met has, who, who had, and have said, how's the opening been for your children? Everyone's just been very, very positive. So, fabulous opening. Um, I also wanted to um, share with you just the easiest way for me to do this is to pass out um, enrollments so that you can actually see what it looks like and I do have extras for the members of the public. Um, what you're going to see is broken down by grade but also compared with the NESDEC projections. Um, our total new enrollments that happened between closing June the 21st and opening um, September, August 30th, uh, 243 students. And you see that in the bottom right hand corner but along wow. the right hand total column shows you the comparison between, there's one there for you Kathy, um, comparison between the total that we, that we welcomed and the projection um, for each of the grade levels, for each of the schools. So you see the total by school and then broken out by grade level. So, and so NESDEC, for example, at the center school, I know that you already heard because we asked you for two paraprofessionals, uh, 55 additional kindergarten students above and beyond those that we already had um, expected. Right. Uh, and we were, our projection really looked at that we shouldn't be expecting because as we've discussed, this is not the first year full day kindergarten and other, other things that, that could happen. Um, what I also wanted to point out was that as we look across the schools, 
it, it, other than center, which is largely kindergarten, the numbers are pretty consistently falling around an average of, you know, it looks like an average quickly of 38, but close to 40, which we can also say is close to two classrooms of students, if we do it that way, um, that we did not project for in our budgeting with you. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to, to, to note about that is, is not calling out NESDIC in any way, but rather than, rather that, we have trends taking place that are beyond expectation. And we have two years of it now um, that we would like to think about, we've always taken the NESDIC projection in terms of working with you on budget projections and class size and numbers of each section. And I think this year you can expect that th we're going to be doing more of a trend analysis and the numbers, um, as Susan and I have talked about, um, because we have enough evidence now to say that the, these numbers are not going to prepare us well for the numbers of sections. And we, mm -hmm. I know now we're asking tonight for the third teacher. Um, I think some of that is based on really thinking about unprecedented growth, unexpected growth, even from, from people that are doing looking at all the statistics. So right. we have some real numbers in front of us. Um, and rather than working on projected numbers, I would propose that we work on real mm -hmm. numbers, um, of course using projections as guidelines, um, but to give you both. Here's the projection, here's the trend that we've had over the past few years in each of these grade levels. And so let's meet somewhere in the middle when we're planning um, for the numbers of sections this coming year. Um, um, any comments or questions about what I just handed you? I mean, just looking at the numbers, right, they triple the projections in some cases, right? Yeah. When, and you know, NESDIC, for instance, um, in one instance, they're projecting two <laughs> children and we have 55 enrollments. That's... Uh, so, okay. so that one's jumping out at me. Yeah. Is this cohort? This is the only one that's not cohort is kindergarten because we don't. So have where a do cohort. they get the two? That's where I wasn't. It, it was really just John on there. Because there's no baseline for that, right? There is not. It's okay. basically it's it's this spreadsheet that I use, right? So they just really go from one year to the other. So they're just going. Um, they're basically. They're, it's like it's like birth projection. That's that there right. There would be two more kindergarten. Yeah, okay. they just said 2016, 17 in kindergarten we will have 224, and in 2017, 18 we will have 226. Now the rest of the data is based oh, on. Oh, so that's oh, I got, I see, what, I got you. Kay. Okay. The rest of it is cohort. Okay. So they, so they, they weren't, they were predicting that the kindergarten class would be two students bigger than the kindergarten class was last year, whereas everyone else is the Correct. grade moved to the grade. Yes. Okay. Because I, I couldn't figure out how we had a projection there, yeah. but that mm -hmm. makes sense. That's why. Yeah. Um, are these are are the numbers you have in here? Are they net numbers or gross ads? The numbers for summer enrollment? Yeah. Gross. Okay, so we could have had some outflow too. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely outflow. Okay. Um, I was just really looking, just a very basic how many. Oh, no, kids, I just, yeah, yeah I just want to yeah. understand in, in context. So, right. yeah, so. so We'd but, have to look at outflow yeah. as well, but yeah. yeah, those are the totals. Okay. Um, you'll be hearing more about it when Carol talks about the L population, but okay. really unprecedented in terms of, and the other piece that we are, we are really did actually struggle with at the end of the summer is the logistics of managing this many just registering mm -hmm. and placing and doing the paperwork and dealing with the new student information system and making sure that transportation because as you know all of these students if they need transportation K-5 but then beyond are guaranteed a spot on the bus mm -hmm. because there is no waiting list if you're new. Right. Um, so there's, there were a lot, there was a lot of, it, you know, that, that last week was a real scramble to get the new computers. I can't even imagine you think about it from the standpoint of, of you've got almost 100 kids at center school where not only are you talking about a new school and all of those logistics, but for 55 of them, it's their first time for that yeah. kid getting to school in general. Right. I, I mean, that's right. got to be an administrative nightmare. Absolutely. I would agree with what John is saying. I mean, even in the high school, you see triple the number projected. But that's very different from a kindergartner, yes. right? And so, how are we how are we handling this? Uh, well, great question. It w do you, if you mean in terms of the numbers and and yeah, um, it really depends on the grade level and the, the school. So when you called out the high school, that was surprising to me too because we haven't seen those kinds of trends there. Um, we just have more opportunity for the numbers of sections. 
uh, just because of the way the schedule works, we can we can handle the influx and uh, the way they do the scheduling and, and the numbers of kids that can fit in. So, and the numbers of electives that we are, you know, fortunate to have. Right. So we're able to do it there. At the middle school, they work within teams, and again, they have an, enough electives and specials for kids that um, they had built their teams in a way that they're, I think we're around 20, 20 to 22 class size, so there's certainly room for another, in their case, another 40. Mm -hmm. Because you spread it not within just a single classroom that takes, you know, has the kids all day long, but they're spread amongst um, an entire team. Mm -hmm. But definitely we feel it. We feel it mostly at Center and, and uh, Elmwood too, as far as class size. Hopkins, we built in an additional section, if you recall, last year. Mm -hmm. um, and they also had an additional co-taught section as part of their budget proposal. Um, so we had more of a cushion available to us, but definitely class size at Center School, not only um, are we beyond where we would want to be, but there was no one, there was no way of creating another class um, because that would have been the first choice. Instead of hiring two paraprofessionals, it would have been to, to create another additional first grade classroom, but there was nowhere to put it. So, um, and then most recently, the Elmwood class size is up to 24, um, which means that now we're getting now we're, not every class because some classes are intentionally kept smaller um, based on the students that they're supporting but 24 in a second grade class is, is too many kids yeah um, so I wanted you to see it but I also you know <coughs> kind of wanted to also share our thinking around as we begin our budget planning um, that this is something we'll certainly take into consideration as we bring you information I would think this would cause a shift in the NESDAQ longer range predictions that they they come out in like October right they always mm -hmm. reset their baseline um, but but that's a great conversation for us to have with them or for me to have with them to say we've got a trend now that is more than just one year mm -hmm. um, that's looking at some significant influx um, as John as you pointed out at our last meeting I think you said something about you know getting to getting to a a point with building and with with the numbers of open spaces that we're going to get to a ceiling at some point mm -hmm. with our numbers and I don't know if we're there yet or if you have a sense of that well so I, I mean, my sense is that we're not even close I mean okay. it's, but but the other thing is I mean we talked well I don't think I necessarily said a ceiling because what we what we were seeing a lot in town is not it's actually um, uh, Susan, I don't know if you've c continued the work of closely monitoring the legacy <coughs> farms and enro enrollments, which is what used to Daily for keep Ralph. Mr. Dumas yeah. up at night. But um, it, it, as we know, it's actually across the district, and right. it actually has a lot more to do with the turnover of existing houses. True. Where, um, I mean, I can it, it, just anecdotally, I can tell you that on my street alone, which is not that big a street, there have there were four houses that sold this summer, and. People moved in. People moved out without kids. People moved in with kids. <laughs> so there's no real ceiling to that. Yeah, true. Um, I think from the Nesdec perspective. So I, I will say, I want to comment just on what you're saying about the budget. Um, I, I really like that conceptually because, as we remember last year, on aggregate, when we figured in the net outflows and new enrollments, Nesdec didn't miss by all that much on the total student population. But as we went grade by grade, right. it became problematic. True. Mm -hmm. And I remember having that conversation at Board of Selectmen meetings and other budget meetings was when we talk about the investment we need to make because of this growth, you can't say NESDEC predicted, you know, 36.50 and we ended up with 36.54 because it's, it's where that happens and some grade levels, especially as you said, these elementary ones grow a lot more and they stick with us a lot longer. So like we had that, I think it was last year, we had that year where the previous senior class was huge and it graduated, but enrollment stayed flat, which means that huge class was made up for somewhere yeah. in the rest of, so, of yeah. the district. So I, I like that concept because when we do the budgeting school by school and grade by grade, for NESDEC purposes, I do think we have to look at the, we have to see what the nets come out like, but, um, I'm trying to remember. I mean, it was back when we were trying to push the MSBA yeah. 
number. that we got Don Kennedy to do that larger refresh, yeah. it might be time again. Hey, I think that's a great well, idea. I, yeah, I mean, he said himself that Hopkinton is an anomaly. Yeah. Yeah. It, like, just unprecedented in any state, any district that he's worked in in his entire career, yeah. which has been a long one. So, yeah, I'll be really curious to hear what they have to say this year. Um, but I agree. I think, I don't think it was too long ago, because it was when we were fr when you first negotiated the enrollment upward that they really did the deeper dive. That's right. So it wasn't that long ago, but I, I agree years. with you. Three I, years, think, right? I think it's definitely yeah. Yeah. worth looking at again because okay. there's something in the water here. Great idea. Yeah. I think having them come is a really good idea. Yeah. And we'll have them come at the beginning of the budget process. Okay. Yeah, that would be good. October. So we don't have, hopefully, we're able to plan for some of these surprises that we had this year. Mm hmm. Right. It's, I think that maybe there they won't be surprises so much. We'll expect them, right? Right. Yeah. Um, the last piece, Jean. I don't know if you want to hold it. Um, the operating timeline and, and let Kathy go ahead. I, I don't know what. Um. Well, she is here. Discussion. That's probably a good idea. It's up to and you. And then she doesn't have to sit and listen to that because that might go off the rails. Okay. <laughs> um. So yeah. Actually, why don't we go back and let Jen do her liaison report so oh, we don't right. forget that. Mm -hmm. And then we'll do, um, and then we'll go to Kathy, and then we'll come back to talk about budget. So I know you wanted to update us about the center school reuse. Yes. So we had our first meeting um, on the 24th of August, and um, it's a big group of people. There's nine people on the committee, and um, they we started off by trying to brainstorm ideas for what folks thought maybe might be a good repurpose of center school, and there were a lot of ideas. Um, so then we kind of took a step back and um, the conversation kind of turned to, um, so we have a lot of ideas and we need to get more input from the community and from other town departments and boards. However, the likelihood of that building being um, sort of vacant for a certain period of time once center school moves to Marathon, it means that we would have to get input from the community and determine what's gonna happen next sometime in like the next six to eight months, which is kind of a quick. So, I mean, it, not that it couldn't happen, but um, s the committee decided to take a step back and see, first of all, what might be the costs associated with keeping the building open. So we're gonna work to figure those out, and I, you know, we'll, we'll figure that out. Um, just vacant, you know, nothing in there. And then, um, then once that's figured out, they'll determine sort of the next step. So, I mean, there are lots of, they've, everything from America, I'm sure everybody's heard many of these before, but the Marathon Museum, um, Youth Center, part of the YMCA, place for each camp, they're just a long list of, of ideas. Um, but they, there is a plan to draft a letter to um, town departments and to solicit input. So this list of 20 will maybe will turn to <laughs> 200 who knows and so from there we have to figure out what what the next step is um, and that's pretty much where it left off um, so I mean we have a few pieces of information to gather um, I guess as far as the school itself is concerned cost wise what we the town would have to take on but other than that we're baby steps moving in the right direction yeah it's interesting yeah, that's going to be one to watch. Okay, yeah. thank yep. you. You got it. Um, okay, so why don't we, yeah, we'll go out of order, if that's okay with you, Kathy, unless Whatever. you just really want to hang out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have Kathy Herville here from Gale Associates, and she's <coughs> going to give us just a quick recap of where we are with in terms of schematic design and the what we actually need to, um, to do is vote uh, on a permitting issue. Um, which she'll help us walk through as well. So, right. well, thank you. Thank you for having me here this evening. Um, and I'm happy um, to report that we've made significant progress in the design and such for, um, for the fields. Um, just to retract, Gale Associates, we've been hired by the school back in, I think it was April, the contract was signed to do the design, permitting, and then construction documents for the synthetic turf fields at um, the high school. I know we have a couple new members who may not have seen the plans at all. Um, I just quickly um, want to hit on um, what we're proposing to do, two synthetic turf fields at the high school. Um, the first one that we're looking at doing in two phases, the first would be what we referred to as field four and five, which is kind of the soccer field down below the tracking field. And the second would be um, up within the track, um, actually expanding the track um, 
which is a little more complicated, um, but then putting in a, another multi-purpose turf field um, there as well. So our intent is to hopefully have this one under construction by next summer, and this one would follow a few years after that, depending on funding, of course. So I just to, to give you a sense what we're talking, uh, multi-purpose, um, softball, baseball, lacrosse, soccer, um, youth sports, all kinds of um, different activities that could take place. And they're also um, proposing to um, light the field so that the, the Hoppington athletic system, the community, um, the sports that we have significant girls, boys, you name it, sports, different ages, practices, games that um, just that grass fields just can't put up with the demand and um, are deteriorating and are in poor shape. So we're advancing with that. So I'd just like to um, hit on is, um, you know, starting with the design. Um, we Early in the spring, we conducted all our field work, um, wetland delineation survey, developed all our base plans for the design plans, um, geotechnical work, we did borings, um, test pits for um, foundation designs, specifically related to the, the athletic lighting, um, and also met with our electrical consultant to confirm that we have adequate service, how we're gonna power the athletic lights and, and that. So that's kind of our initial step. We then kind of pulled all of that information together, um, developed what we refer to as our schematic drawings, um, and with that sat down with the turf committee. I think we're going on meeting number five next week um, to basically um, program the whole facility. Um, what I have up, I don't know if you've got it on the screen, um, is, and I think it was in a packet that you're provided because mm -hmm. I don't think you put it up for me. Is it up there? Looks like it's coming. Um, just so you get a sense of what we've gone through with the committee and the work that they've gone, um, like I said, it's attached to your packet for each of the fields, what we refer to field four or five and, and the track and field. We went through everything, every possible thing that we need to think about, whether it's fencing, gates, lights, um, goals, press box, press um, sound systems, um, the synthetic turf, um, as Jean had mentioned, we're in the process of evaluating what we think is going to be the best synthetic turf and infill um, for the project and for the town. Um, we look at ADA access, we look at flagpoles. Um, we just go through this laundry list and look at not only just looking at the, um, all the various items at the different fields and the things that we, we need. Um, you know, we basically take that, um, put it into the design plans, and then we try to put cost to all of that as well. Um, we've presented to the, the turf committee, um, I think two rounds of cost estimates. We're, we're getting very close. Um, and you'll find if you, again, this is also in your packet, there's two cost estimates attached, um, one for each of the fields. Um, and you'll find that if you look at the programming guide and you look at the cost estimate, there's a correlation between that. And that's what we're you know, trying to meet and what we've discussed and what um, the school fields they want. Um, just to say the turf committees worked really hard to identify items that we feel we need and absolutely have to provide as part of the, the turf project, but then there's a lot of items that we've kind of put down, you'll see down below the total line, um, that addresses things that would be nice to have if, if the funding's there, but um, not necessarily have to be done at this time and could be maybe something, there's additional fundraising and things like that done later. Um, so with that, um, I, again, I've just, I've brought on, I just, um, I don't know if you want to go through the, the plans per se or how detailed well, so Jean, I think, you want I mean, to get our into. Main, our main purpose tonight is that we need to vote on the, um, on the permit application because you need to get that filed. So I think in the interest of time, probably won't have a long conversation about questions per se about yeah. the project unless somebody has like a quick question that we can um, that we can answer. I do want to say too, it's not on there, but you know, you remember that the cross country course that we're going to talk about in a little bit basically goes all around this. So uh, Kathy has done a great job working with Peter Lagoy to make sure that wherever she's putting fences isn't interfering with the cross country course. So they've, they've been designing things, um, you know, with each other in mind basically, which has been, um, great. So I think, um, if there are sort of high level questions about the project in general, we can do that. But if you want to talk to us about what 
the permit is that we need okay. to file yep. and I think we just yep. need to vote to authorize that. Yep. Um, just, just so you know, so basically um, what you see before you on the screen is what we're referring to as our permit set. It consists of numerous drawings, um, just starting with the existing conditions to demolition and such um, into grading layouts and such and then there's sheets and sheets of details whether it's um, goal posts whatever and, and so on um, but this is what we consider our 90 percent design set which we will um, you know take to the next stage based on input from the permits and such um, but what we need is um, the bottom line is the site has wetlands um, adjacent to just pop up to the, the your, your existing conditions plan um, Basically, you're looking up at the lower, you can see the track down on the lower half, but you see these kind of squiggly lines, one, some up at the north side of the page, some down off to the, um, to the your left. Um, we have wetlands that basically buffer the, the north and the um, southern ends of the fields. Um, not that we're working in the wetlands per se, but the existing fields sit in the buffer zones as well. Our intent is not to disturb any additional area, but that because you are doing work in that buffer zone, we're required to go to the Conservation Commission for a notice of intent. On August 2nd, we did have a meeting with the town to confirm what permits to make sure we were covered. We were concerned about the lights and all of that. I know John sat in on a conference call and, and D. King sat in with me at the permit and it was determined by the town that the only permit we need is this notice of intent from the Conservation Commission. There's no permit for the lighting. It's, they're not considered structures. Um, so not to say it won't, um, necessarily be it'll be a, a it'll be a, a difficult process I don't want to say difficult process but um, you know we're gonna have some um, hurdles to get over um, but the bottom line is because we are working in those buffer zones we have to go for the notice of intent what I have what the notice of intent application package consists of is this set of permit drawings um, we also have this is our application package the majority of this package um, there's various forms um, that are issued by DEP it's a standard we have various checklists from the town and DEP regarding stormwater erosion control um, and how we also were required to meet the DEP what they call the stormwater handbook we prove we take there's 10 points we make sure we meet all of those regarding water quality and all of that and then the last part is the the really big chunk of this is what we call our hydrocad calculations where we prove that we haven't increased um, runoff from proposed condi existing conditions to proposed conditions which is kind of their their biggest concern so within this there is an application um, that I need a signature yeah respectfully request a signature from the um, from the board to make the submittal and our um, our goal is to submit it first thing next week we have to have it in by the 13th we're gonna shoot to get it in on Monday um, and um, beyond the hearing for the CONCOM on October 2nd okay. so and get things rolling so 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 the um, the quick action is that we need just to make a motion to authorize I think on our motion it says athletics field subcommittee chair but because of, that's a subcommittee to the school committee I think it's better if I do it so we'll just change that in the motion um, but just I know there's also been conversation around the wetlands replication so I just want to make sure that we're all clear on what it is and what it is not that we're doing mm -hmm. um, right now so right now we're do we're authorizing her to submit the notice of intent for this project but there is an outstanding um, order of conditions related to a project when the high school or the athletic fields were originally built which is long before any of us were sitting here that has come to light as part of the investigation work for this process so that needs to be addressed it's a pre-existing condition that hasn't that wasn't addressed when it should have been so that's something that we need to take care of that's not what we're talking about today um, Kathy at Ralph's suggestion um, Kathy has done the engineering and had conversation with the town about that because we're quite certain that we're not going to be able to move this for project forward until there's a plan in place to address that outstanding order so she will address that issue in her cover letter and she's given a draft of that to us and Susan in particular I think is really good on the language that we need to have um, that's not part of the permit this is just part of the cover letter that's going to go with the permit because we know that that's going to be um, an issue as as they evaluate our permit request so is that a fair That's assessment correct. of yeah. where we stand what well, we've done we have not shown in this permit set of drawings we do not show that replication we don't bring it up we don't discuss it at all 
in this package. And like I said, we but, but well, our concern is that when we go to the CONCOM, we know that issue's out there and we don't want them to feel we've ignored it because right. I know I know Kathy's had a meeting with them. We've had meetings with them. You know, it, it's out there and, and you know, we, I'd rather, you know, we just be forward with it and, you know, come up with a way that everybody can, you know, be satisfied but yet not, you know, cost a fortune either, so. Can you share what the issue is going to work with, you should say? That right, was that, was, that was Ralph's suggestion exactly. that we contract with them separately so Correct. that we did do that, yeah. 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 Can you please share what the issue is? So, well, you can just okay. write um, Back when the athletic fields were um, constructed originally, we're talking 1995, they were permitted, and I think they were finished by about 1998. Um, they actually went in in this area, this assume this is the old grass field. Um, there was a wetland that kind of ran up through the middle of this field and to build this field, they had to um, take, get rid of part of that wetlands. They, they had to um, eliminate it. So based on the regulations, if you impact a wetland directly, you have to replace it somewhere else. And usually it's at, like, if you get rid of one acre, usually you have to replace it with two acres or maybe one and a half acres. The Wetland Protection Act is a one and a half to one ratio. They can bump it up to two to one, which in fact is what the school was committed that they were supposed to do. So I think, so there was an area back in, back in this area that was proposed as part of that replication area. And then there was a location in this area that was part of that replication. And when the fields got done, and it's not cheap to do, it does require special soils, special vegetation, um, you've got to design it. Um, so it didn't get done at the time, and I'm sure cost might have been the reason, who knows, but um, so the, when you finish a project through the Conservation Commission, you get an order of conditions. Is what that's that's your approval, and that's exactly what it is. An order of a, a bunch of conditions. You need to do this. You need to do that. And one of the conditions was that they had to do this wetland replication. When you basically finish a project and everything is done, you request a certificate of compliance, which means you've done everything so that you can close that order of conditions, and the, the project's done and nothing can come back after you later. But unfortunately, the town has not forgotten about this replication and every time, you know, every time the school does something, I think it kind of rears its head. I know they finished one open order that was affiliated with the loop road and that just got closed um, through a letter and, and a, a miracle, whatever. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, maybe there's some solution out there for, yeah. the, for this as well. But um, in the meantime, you know, we, when I first approached the con, con agent, he was very quick to say, you know, the school has this outstanding yeah. order on the fields and it, you know, it, it's gonna come up. And we just don't, we don't wanna get all geared up and be ready to, you know, our, our goal is get the permitting done, be ready with bid docs by early next year so that we can bid and be ready to build this thing. And we don't want to have something come back on the permit, on this permit because of that issue. So we're trying to deal with it separate and keep it out of this permit, but it's probably gonna come back at least through discussions with the mm -hmm. CONCOM. Right. So. Any other questions? I'm just glad Kathy answered that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, all right, well, in that case, I just am looking for a motion to authorize the school committee chair to sign and submit the athletic fields permit application to the Conservation Commission on behalf of the school committee and the schools. So moved. In a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that's unanimous. And I will sign it, and then you can go on your way, unless you want to stay, because yeah. the rest of our meeting is fascinating. Sign right here. Right here. You don't have to sign the lower one, because you okay. have a serious document. I know. Uh, do I need, you need like, the date? Yes. They put the 7th. Put the day. We dated everything the 7th. So. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. That was well, heavy. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. I will see you next week. Yep. And you will receive, we'll, we'll set up a drop box where you guys can go in and
see this this application will be online for you guys as well as the, the full set of the plans I think you all got like a smaller version of the plans um, but I don't think they were the final final permit set so those will be available um, once we make the submittal great so, great okay. thank you thank you very thank you much for taking me early and I do want to say Kathy I was saddened to hear that you're retiring oh, I think you. you've done a terrific job um, since you've come into office thank so you, Kathy. I've enjoyed working with you I know you'll be around for this but yes. <laughs> when we have our groundbreaking <laughs> yeah, invited back. Be there. thanks you're very welcome kind. all right so should we shift over to budget? back to my back to my uh, report yes so I'm passing out something that is in your packet and for anybody following along at home it's in the school committee packet but because you did receive several different um, different updates on the budget timeline or at least the um, recommended budget timeline that we're going to be discussing tonight as part of my report I wanted to just hand out the right version <laughs> um, because there have been several meetings over the past couple of weeks and um, Susan and I have been working closely along with Norman and Chris um, Sandini the director of finance for the town to bring you a proposal um, for your consideration and for discussion purposes tonight. Um, also in your in your um, packet is the town manager's charter budget timeline. It just looks like this. Um, and this was what it had been proposed by the town manager um, of significance to you and to us and what we were working from um, was a budget process that would include that all budgets including the school budget be um, voted on and, and complete by December the 1st and so you can see um, the requested dates that uh, and and these are for, was for discussion purposes at a at a meeting that took place um, last week um, that Jean was at mm -hmm. and then there had been a follow-up meeting after this um, and after I gave you the documents in your packet with Susan and myself and, and Chris Sandini and Norman Kamalo. Um, what I wanted to walk you through tonight was really the work that Susan and I had done and what the, the, it, here was our lens. We wanted to consider the recommend or the request of the town manager. We wanted to um, do our best to collaborate for it to be a collaborative budget process understanding that the charter has changed mm -hmm. and that the school committee absolutely ha gets to have a vote and weigh in on the timeline of when the budget would be um, would be complete uh, we also wanted to honor all of the people who we work with and the timelines that they're working under when we work within a budget process so that what we get to you is complete and not rushed um, and that we feel that we have time to do this in a, in a very um, thorough way. And so what we're proposing to, for your discussion tonight is something that Susan and I, and she's here to take any questions herself, um, feel very comfortable with in all, in all of those, for all of those um, kind of lenses, right? So as we look through it, um, and if you compare it to last year's timeline, which is also in your pack, but it just doesn't say operating. It just says budget timeline 2017-18. When you compare this document to that document, we're basically looking at a difference of two weeks. Uh, backing everything up two weeks, does, it adds on one meeting to our schedule. It would add on a December the 14th meeting that we don't currently have scheduled. Mm -hmm. And that would be the proposed joint meeting where we would it would be the superintendent's budget proposal um, at which the the suggestion would be that board of selectmen and appropriations in, in in their entirety would be invited not just the liaison the reason that's being recommended is because of the feedback that we received and the process that we went through last spring where the board of selectmen uh, communicated to us that they didn't feel that they had had an opportunity for their questions to be addressed around the school committee's operating and capital budgets. And even though we had gone through a very thorough and open process, um, we heard that, inf heard that information and we wanted to take it under consideration in planning this year, how could we address this in a way that people feel heard and feel that they've had an opportunity to ha ask their questions before the school committee make makes a final vote on what is your budget. And so one of the thoughts we had was if we had it during the superintendent's budget recommendation which if we were to do December the 14th would still give us some time to make changes um, 
you would not have voted the budget at that point. The proposal here is that the public hearing and school committee vote would not take place until January the 4th um, with a final vote and submission to the town manager of January the 5th. Last year, we did that on January the 18th. We had the public hearing and school committee vote on January the 18th. We have given the feedback to Mr. Kamalo that, there's, that we did not feel comfortable um, recommending a December the 1st deadline for any of the reasons described above, um, that we could feel comfortable if he could back up some dates on his timeline, um, namely uh, September the 26th on the budget process, uh, the, the discussion came around gaining consensus in order to uh, develop a budget message. And the feedback that, that we gave, that Jean and, and Susan and I gave, was that that was just way too late in our process. Um, so as you may have heard, we have a joint meeting scheduled with them for September the 12th. So they were able to back that date up. The other date that they were able to back up um, was the, gen rather than having the school budgets due on December the 1st, like all of the other departments, um, that we would recommend, suggest, uh, that we could potentially meet a January the 5th deadline. Um, Mr. Kamalo and Jean, please jump in in terms of the thinking around all of this, would be to have all of the information, including capital, way earlier in the process. But in addition, the town manager and finance director are proposing uh, at that meeting next week of a really sharing a formula and a um, more of a what did they call the presentation that they made it was more than a formula it was just really considering information that is already available to us readily available so that we could come up with a clearer percentage that could be somewhat more realistic mm -hmm. um, and informed yeah, so he was, model. He, he's using a financial projection model. There you go. That's what it was. And it was a model that Mr. Um, Sandini shared with all of us at the meeting, showed how we could populate it with information that is already available, understanding that there's information that won't be available. Um, and you can help me here with some of the things that I know, John, you've been very um, vocal in some concerns around information that we didn't have last year that we felt that, that could have been more available to us. And then Mr. Sandini spoke about some of the budget projections that we don't get until later into the spring, the solid numbers around what, Susan? Um, well, the biggest, um, the biggest guessing piece, if you will, is new growth. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So new growth really, you know, is, is being finalized now for this year. Mm -hmm. So you know as with any financial projection it is based on assumptions um, so there is um, some playing around with some assumptions of the new growth and the new growth model has been higher in the last couple years but they do feel that that really is starting to slow and trend back um, so that that's a number that while it's a soft number you have to be careful with um, so typically you'll probably err on the conservative side on that but that's basically one of the big numbers some of the numbers that are known are debt um, so th those are solid numbers so those are the things so the financial projection model is built off of assumptions as as we can all imagine as and any budget is and then some numbers that are that are more solid so so I went through all of this, um, really the main, quickly, but the main differences are backing everything up by a couple of weeks. Susan and I do not feel that it constrains our principals and our directors because it, it really the way we've looked at the calendar is in a way that didn't affect them. Mm -hmm. um, and the meetings that we had talked about having, the only additional one would be a special meeting, proposing a special meeting on December the 14th. Um, because when we looked at our calendar, our, our school committee calendar, and we were very much aware of working around holidays and things like that, and certainly had discussed actually pushing forward um, our budget planning into February, March, um, could have been preferable. So uh, we really 
provide this to you tonight for discussion purposes um, under my report. I don't know if you need to have a vote um, or what you think well, at this point. I think because the next thing that we're going to do is be invited to this joint meeting on September 12th, which I assume must be posted by yep. now. It's been posted. Well, it's been posted for us. For us. Um, so I think it would be good if we had some discussion and kind of got up generally on the same page <laughs> with each other before we walk in and try to get on the same page with 10 other people um, that I'll have to vote on this. So does anybody have any initial, I have a couple of thoughts about the schedule, but I don't know if the rest of you had some suggestions, thoughts, concerns. I mean, if we have already moved from last year from the 18th to the 5th, uh, is there any, what's the reason behind why uh, it has to be moved in, you know, four more weeks it almost looks like, right? Uh, what's, the, what's the reason for that? How does it help uh, Mr. Kamala and the town to have it that early? Did you have a good sense of that, Jean? I think what they have said every year is that they need our number earlier to, to do their work and to be um, able to send information out earlier to people in town prior to town meeting. I can see by John's face that he is remembering the practical application of us moving that That's forward. True. I, tip, traditionally, for the first, I guess, <coughs> seven years I was on the school committee, our submission date was February 2nd. That was what was in the chart, F February 1st. That was what was in the charter. And that's when we always submitted our budget. Last year, we did work really hard to push that forward to try to help them speed their process along and get um, better detail to the okay. voters prior to town meeting. Because what has been happening is you walk in and you get these big documents uh, and it's uh, that's your only chance to look at it. So the goal was to get that out two weeks in advance of town meeting, which was required under the charter and they weren't able to meet it. Um, so we did do that earlier. It didn't, it didn't help the process last year. I can't say that's, I can't say what all the reasons were for that really. Um, you know, I think to your point, Kathy, uh, I can't explain it because there's a part of it that I don't understand, which is that while we don't have a final number voted, we do have a preliminary number out there in November, right? Which I don't remember ever, if or maybe once, that we went higher than that. Usually <laughs> lower. Right? Than it's that. always lower. So I, I feel like they have a placeholder that they can start. I don't know enough about their finance financial models to know how different that is. I, I felt like this year they were more inclined to try to give everyone a target to work towards. Does that seem right based on what they were discussing? Yes. Um, so that almost argues for it not mattering when we put it in if we're working towards a number that they've already given us that they know they can work with. So, mm -hmm. um, so I definitely have some questions and I can't really articulate the answers those questions based on the meeting that we had because um, you know I'm not this is not my area of strength um, so you guys can feel free to jump in if I'm not doing it justice it, the it was justice. it was uh, I, the reason I asked you um, I, I feel the same way I, I don't feel that I can clearly articulate an answer to the question as to why specifically because like Jean I don't understand their process um, and how having a solid number as we all experienced last, was it May? No, April. Mm -hmm. um, the pers th there was a, a, a change to what we thought we had been working towards all along. Um, so, yeah, I can't answer either. I don't know if you well, I, I think there was a little bit of, you know, as you said in November, there's, there's somewhat of a soft number, mm -hmm. if you will, because we are putting out a preliminary, but I think um, both Norman and Chris are a little cautious in using a preliminary budget because they do respect your process. Mm -hmm. So they, they would like for you to have voted your budget, which is why they're willing to go to the January 5th mm -hmm. submission. Um, so this process does look a little different from what you're operating under, I'm, I'm assuming, previously. So you're right, you know, that it's we're using a financial, potentially using a financial model to show what the town can afford in the, in the budget guidelines. Um, so, but I think they are trying to be respectful of your process in that he will accept the budget from you once you've passed it. 
One advantage, if I, I'm sorry, Nancy. No, go ahead. Just I will add to to what uh, Susan just said that I felt was would be helpful to us was we did feel that we were operating operating in a vacuum last year because we didn't have information from the other departments, um, and what seemed to to be proposed was that there would be more information shared up front, um, so that everybody would know it would it would be very clear in terms of you know not the budget the budget message not saying we're all working towards three percent but determining what the budget percent would be that people were working towards um, from the beginning and that we would know that we would know what the set numbers are at least to the best of our ability um, and it would be more more information up front than we've had in the past that was something that I took from it that I yeah I mean I definitely the other Chris we did do it that way when that was where we got the four percent number that we didn't that um, that was started as a placeholder and then ended up to be apparently our target so we have tried it that way as well I I um, I know I'm getting off track I think what we should really talk about is how comfortable we are that we can I, I understand and respect that they would like our number a solid number earlier so how comfortable are we that through this schedule we can deliver that or or is there are there adjustments that we need to make to this schedule that will make us more confident that we can get to the point that they need us to be because um, I think the rest of it you know I think Susan has a better grasp on all of that than I do personally, but um, but I you know I think those questions we can talk about when mm -hmm. we are all. The other thing I will add though is that we had talked about um, having more joint meetings, so yes. inviting them to our meetings, that our our being invited to their meetings in terms of just everybody having better um, information, and mm -hmm. so I, so that's obvious. That's one of the reasons mm -hmm. why um, we had invited them to come to our. Um, the superintendent's budget recommendation in December. I think what happened last year, just as a recap for those who were not there, typically the school committee chair, director of finance, superintendent have gone to a board of selectmen meeting and presented the budget and answered questions. Um, and then after that, there's a joint meeting where the town manager presents the entire budget to the school committee, appropriations committee, board of selectmen. That first step didn't happen last year. And so when we went to that second step, I think is where the confusion came in and the concern from the Board of Selectmen that they really were seeing this for the first time and were not feeling like they had a chance to understand what was in our budget, which typically they've been given the opportunity to do. So um, so I do think it would be helpful to, to make sure that that step is happening, whether we now consider them coming to our meeting that step or there are other opportunities for us to have joint meetings along the way. Um, I think that would be an important point of clarification for our joint meeting next week. I mean, sorry, go ahead. I, I just have a question. <coughs> I mean, in your experience, you've done this for a few years, many of you. Uh, if it's pushed back from February to January, it added a la layer of um, a challenge, right, to determine some good numbers. I mean, there's some things that are given, as you said, that we know they're going to be um, consistent year to year, and some things that are a little more difficult to project so you've already moved it back a month and now it in theory would be moving back almost another month that was the original request right <coughs> so I guess as we continue to move these dates further and further away from the actual day that we need the budget to be in place the soft numbers are more and more difficult to predict not right. that two weeks is going to make a huge difference but if it's two weeks and then another year two weeks and then another year and so it eventually is two months I feel like that our, our numbers, by and large, are dependent on the information that's being given to us from all of the departments. Right. And those, those meeting dates haven't changed overall in, oh. in either of those scenarios, whether so it was the February submission or the January submission of last year's January the 18th. The meetings, the bulk of the meetings that took place where we were gathering information is beginning at the beginning of October right through till the beginning, you know, so the month of October. So it's more time um, to synthesize that information? You know, or it gives more time, um, not so much at the building level, but it gives more time if they have to go back to the drawing board. Okay. Um, but one of the things we talked about is if we're doing, if we're going to be looking at um, working towards a more of a solid number, then there's less of a need to go back. 
Uh, well, depending on how what that number is. Correct. <laughs> if it's a very low number, then there might be a lot of that is true. Reasons yeah. to or times that you it, need to. It's definitely more our time. Yeah. Um, and no matter what, we've talked about from the very beginning that this always feels really early. And I did raise with the town manager um, that this feels really early. And you know, as a superintendent, knowing that in many towns they begin the process in January. Mm -hmm. And there was a reason why we couldn't do it that way, beyond beyond the way we've always done it. But there was definitely, um, I did express that it feels that a lot of it has to be guesswork um, based on what we are projecting that is almost a year away. And that's my sort of my point yeah. of bringing up this timeline, is that if you're guessing, then it's not, it, maybe it's a great number, maybe you're a good guesser, maybe you can use, you know, Susan's magic, she can work her magic and it'll be a, a great number, but I feel like if we keep pushing the timeline back, the likelihood of that happening yeah. is less. I hear you. Yeah. So. I mean, I, that's definitely a concern that we've had along the years when these conversations have, have arisen. The other thing that I think is important to think about for this particular year, and I was originally thinking this would make it easier and realized that I was wrong and it makes it more difficult. Um, we just are in the third year of our three-year contract with the teachers. And so our biggest, sing our single budget, biggest budget driver is salary. And we, are, we have not yet entered negotiations for the salaries that they're going to be paid next year. So we don't have, a f our biggest number is not a firm number mm -hmm. um, at this point. And I mean, ha having said that, two weeks or four weeks is probably not gonna make a difference um, in that this year, but it did make it easier for us last year to move our forward our process forward a few weeks because our biggest number was set right. um, in terms of we knew what their percentage increase was going to be and so that made it a little bit more comfortable to give up the extra two weeks last year um, I mean uh, one of the thoughts on my mind was if I can understand the why part of it I mean it's already September we put in a lot of thought when we put together the calendar trying to bring it in I know we looked at all of our calendars and you know you have the whole team to look at so we put in a lot of thought into coming up with the calendar if we can understand the why even if you're not able to accommodate it this year perhaps there's room for next year that we can consider it but the understanding the why part would be important mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, the things that you talked about, can we invite, you know, Mr. Kumalo and the Board of Selectmen early into the process and let them join us and hear and go through the process a little bit if that makes them more comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, go ahead. I was going to say, I, the January 5th I like a whole lot better than the December 1st, <laughs> yeah. but I, I still have concerns about it I in terms of, to have a public hearing, right. On January 4th, we've just come back from a period of people not paying attention. Not paying attention. I like to think that we invite as much public participation into our process as we can. And doing it that week is not going to, people are. Right. You're just back to school. Well, You're I just back to school. I think right. even the following week would be better and than. That's why we this. did that last year, for that exact same I reason. Think, yeah. That was going to be my suggestion. I think maybe if we. <laughs> did this December 14th meeting, if we did that on January 4th, and then had, if we're adding a meeting, if we added that on January 11th for the public hearing and the final vote, that is, I think, a little bit more fair to the public. Um, that, to your point, Kathy, is if, if we are driving towards a number and you all are having to go you've you've we've gone through all of our meetings with all of the departments and if we're finding that you know our recommended budget is four percent and the town wants us to drive to 3.75 you're going to need that feedback from us to go back and work with all the department heads and that gives you some time mm -hmm. to do that and then bring that back to mm -hmm. us as well as the board of selectmen and the appropriations committee on that january 4th meeting mm -hmm. so that would be just without pushing it out back to my favorite day of February 1st, um, I feel that would be a little bit more fair to the public and reasonable in terms of what we may need to be doing internally, mm -hmm. but at least closer to what they are looking for. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds fair. Does anybody else have? Uh, 
skeptical doesn't even begin to describe my feelings on this town <laughs> proposed budget calendar. Um, this is my seventh seventh budget, including appropriation. As Jean pointed out, we did the first five of them with a February 1st deadline. And consistently, we would come to a pretty close to final budget sometime in January and would go back to the town and say, here's where we are. We'd like to know if we're close to something that could be, that, that we could afford. Or do we need to go back and sharpen our pencils a little bit? What type of adjustments do we need to make? What kind of sense can you give us? And we were consistently met with radio silence every time we did that. Last year, the town manager asked us for an earlier budget. And one of the negotiating conditions for that was that if we were able to provide them with a budget earlier, they would be able to give us an earlier response to that question. Mm -hmm. Last year was the worst budget season I've ever been through in terms of the communication we had and information we had from the town. And I think, honestly, that's what drove the majority of the difficulty that we had in working with the Board of Selectmen was they were working from as little information as we were. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the idea of a financial model. I'm, I'm used to getting there around about October 1st and them giving us a projection that usually includes a placeholder number for us and then some projections for revenue that don't really make a ton of sense based on prior years. I, I don't see how backing this up into December makes sense when you consider that that gets us to, Susan, to your point about the projections, we're further away from new growth. We're further away from state aid. We're further away from free cash. We're talking about moving this into, into an area where we're further disconnecting the development of the amount of money we need as a town from having any idea how much money we're actually going to have. It, it feels very much like we're moving in the wrong direction with mm -hmm. no faith that we're going to get the information that we need to be able to, to accomplish this. I mean, I'm thinking about our colleagues on the Appropriation Committee who for the last two years have had a budget handed to them by the Board of Selectmen that they say, hey, if you guys can reduce this for us, that would be great. With, again, no sense of how they're actually supposed to get there. Of all of these things, I have two concerns, one of which you've already allayed, which is what pressure does this put on the administrative staff? If you're telling me that you believe you can do the work you need to do in this, in the, I'm pointing at the wrong one, in this time frame, I, I'm comfortable that we can react to that. Right? If we want to add another an extra meeting, if I do agree that I think we talked about it last year, January 4th feels like you're dropping a public hearing on people when they're just coming back from vacation, they're not there yet, I, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I think the second concern I have, and, and the reason I have this concern is because I'm actually starting to find my mindset turning this way, which is the behavior this is going to drive from town departments, quite frankly, including ours, is if we don't have that information, if they want a final voted budget earlier, mm. I'm going to be more inclined to put more in it. Because if there's a nice to have, I'm not necessarily going to take it out if I have no sense of what the revenue picture is. If you're telling me that based on what we have, we can afford X, Y, and Z, if we apply the typical percentages, our, our target should be about 4% because we consistently say we don't want to put the town in a position where we're going to challenge the two and a half. So that that's my concern is as we go through this process yeah. is that the, the earlier we move this and the more we disconnect that from that information and and again I'll, I'll put my experience based skepticism on here. Yeah, I'd love it if we could have more of a connection to what those town departments are looking at for their increases. It, it would be the first time it's ever happened in my experience. So I, I, that's my concern overall about this process. For what I think we were trying to accomplish with the charter in terms of making it a collaborative process and setting this between the school committee, the appropriation committee, and the board of selectmen, I guess maybe I was thinking about this the wrong way. I thought it was going to be more about more, more, about more than dates. 
and and that's that's what I'm seeing the exact same activities here with earlier dates mm -hmm. as opposed to how are we actually going to make this process better so that we don't end up where we were last year mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I just I'm yeah, gonna, I want to say all this again on Tuesday yeah but I, I that's so from our perspective if you're saying to me operationally the administrative team can handle this mm -hmm. timing wise this works we're not gonna um, I mean and I think about even the variables that we have we're opening a new school next year Right. We, That's we also have a superintendent search process. Superintendent at, at search the same process. Time that we're doing budget. Yeah, you mentioned the the, the salary piece with the teachers, and right. you said you know two, two or three weeks isn't going to make that much difference. It's not going to make that much difference in us knowing exactly what the number is, but two or three weeks could be one or two meetings, yep. negotiating meetings, and that could have, give us a much better idea of what percentage we're talking about, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we can start thinking about that. It, it th this is. Mm -hmm. I really have significant concerns that this is, and I, I admittedly, I'm talking to the wrong audience here, and that's mm -hmm. why I'm looking forward to Tuesday. But it feels like we're setting ourselves up for it again. Mm -hmm. so, so, John, I mean, typically any budget process, you know, we talk about the cone of uncertainty. The further you are mm -hmm. from the point of execution, it's going to be, you know, not accurate. So as you get closer to the date, then your certainty to the budget number increases. The farther you are, the wider it is. Right. You could be so off the number, up or down. Right. 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 Well, look at the experience that we just had with the enrollment data that you gave us, how far. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think um, the other question that I would have is I don't see if the new model, and maybe I'm not portraying this accurately, but if the new model involves them saying we are um, projecting a four percent increase for the schools this year when what is the date they're going to tell us that because you all are already starting your internal process and I know you're starting from ground zero and building up but eventually those two your process and the ceiling if you will that they're putting on us have to meet somewhere so I don't see where that is on this calendar but obviously the earlier the better because the you know they were showing us how the model worked and so they said, so for example, you can plug in 4% and we can waterfall that to see what the impact is on the taxes and the overall budget. Or you could put in, was it 1.17%? 1. 1. 1. I didn't like that number. No, I wasn't curious, <laughs> you know, that had a much better impact on the overall the town ARL. budget, obviously, but it was not realistic without right. a critical change. Um, so I think that that would be the other important question. So just to kind of, recap in terms of what we want questions that we have that we would like to get answered because the goal is i believe on tuesday to arrive in an agreement between all three committees as we're mandated to do under the charter so first we would like to understand how does it help the town's process to have our number not about not our preliminary number but our final number how does it help their process to have it earlier What's the value added to that? Yeah, and I think you just, I think, so I will say, I, I will, it, you said our final number, right? So that maybe that's where, like, I, I could change 75% of what I just said is, why do they need the final voted number by then if we all have all this work to do? Right. Right, so if we could give them, and I'm not saying we want to give them a guidance number, but if we do all this work, we're going to have a really good idea of where we are. Right. Maybe we don't take that final budget vote until we get more of a sense. I, I believe the meeting on Tuesday not only is to discuss this process, but is to give gu that that guidance okay. number of yep. each That's department. You know, DPW, you're going to have X percent. Schools, you're going to have X percent. So when we leave that September 12th meeting next week, the goal is for everyone to know exactly what they're working toward. And it is based on soft numbers, and you're right, there are assumptions, and as you get closer, um, what they also talked about so as the number changes so if the total school department budget is X percent of the total town department budget as the numbers change as you get closer and closer to where they're tighter numbers that percentage share is what they're going to also talk about so if the number goes up then schools you get this percentage share of what the number went up DPW you get this percentage share so they have thought about how that changes as it goes down the line. So it's, it's a couple things. Looking at that financial model, 
what can we afford for each department based on what that does to the tax levy at the end of the day determine that on Tuesday but then looking further down the road as numbers get tighter what does that mean in terms of the share if revenue is going up or down so and that's the goal of, of Tuesday as well is the expectation that um, you will see that number before Tuesday and I ask for those of us who were here last year at, at this parallel meeting last year they gave us a guidance number and our response was we literally it doesn't even cover personnel yeah. I forget what it was it was like it was, it was like three it was like three percent and we did, we said literally it, it, our our just general contractual increases were already over that number and yet somehow when we came back in the spring that number was pointed back to even though we said we literally told you we can't do that mm -hmm. so that's why I was wondering if there was an opportunity for you to see that to maybe head that off to make sure that it's at least a palatable number I mean we could certainly uh, try to have a meeting with follow up I mean I'm, I'm taking notes of course uh, of things that I want to follow up based on your comments tonight um, we could certainly reach out to see if we could do that ahead of time if yeah we, I just yeah. I think for everyone involved I yeah. mean it was it was not a good no. scene last right. year when we saw that number and right. just basically had to say right it doesn't well, and that was, you know, as, as I'm thinking back, that was the budget message, wasn't it? And mm -hmm. the, the feedback to the budget message that we hadn't seen was we can't work towards that number. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, my understanding was the same as Susan's, that they were, they were hoping at this meeting to not only have consensus on the timeline, okay. but on these, a, a more open discussion about the percentages. Um, and, but no, I did not think that, you know, we were going to have this opportunity beyond the feedback that we've already given at the meeting that Jean was at. That 1.1 was not something that we could, you know, that we was did. A hard stopper. We can rule that one out. Yeah. Um, so, and that wasn't, I mean, I'm being, I know. That, yeah. I'm just using that yeah. as an example. They weren't really advocating for that, to be fair. Just so the school committee knows, however, uh, you know, we won't be anywhere near finalizing negotiations. I did have a conversation with um, the the HTA Association um, and we have met with Kim Polnick they don't even have their um, their elections until the end of September mm -hmm. they won't be ready to even begin to meet with us until the end of October um, that would be there that would be our organizational that would be our best our best solution and we're meeting out already to try to coordinate that date mm -hmm. um, end of September would be our meeting when we our ground rules meeting so uh, even if we have a really great first meeting um that's going to be into november mm -hmm. um i don't think realistically we'll be near a, a contract until maybe march right. so, and okay. that's with all of us you know working really hard towards it let me let me see if i can recap where we are because i know we could talk about this for three more hours um for sure so when we go on tuesday what what we would like to understand better is I mean sort of how the model is working since we can't articulate it mm -hmm. as well as you can um, h how it is that having our voted number earlier f helps facilitate their process better um, sounds like we don't need to ask when we're going to get the number because it's going to be um, presented to us there and I think more understanding of the context of the impact that our number is having on other town departments because we are always we say that every year we just feel like you know we're left over here in a vacuum and we're advocating for what we need but if we later are finding out that means you know the entire police department has to be eliminated and obviously we need to recalibrate what our what our needs are so um so those are our questions are is is our consensus that we would prefer to have our and to invite them to the superintendent's recommended budget presentation on January 4th and have our, be, our vote be on January 11th. And then just also to explain to them for context that the considerations that we are looking at this year are not only an enrollment boom, which, which brings with it increased services and increased number of seats, but in addition, we, we are you know planning for opening the new school. We're entering into negotiations for a new contract. And at the same time that we're doing all of this, we're also um, conducting our superintendent search. So 
you know, absolutely we want to be team players, but we also want to give a good number when we give our number. And so sure. that's those are sort of the yeah. the items that we're working with. I think this is a good with. supporting artifact. Too. Yes. I was yeah. In the enrollment in general. Oh, good. Yeah. Um. And so, in terms of anything before Tuesday, you'll just communicate to Norman. Mm -hmm. Sort do, Your I, do I need to do I need to send anything to the board of selectmen, or you'll just sort of let him give him the heads up about this is what we talked about, or my opinion is that I think both is a really great idea. Okay. I think that I will communicate these these points back that this is what the schools committee is expecting out of that meeting on the twelfth, um, and then I think if you did the same with the chair. I think that's okay. a great idea. Or maybe we have a meeting in the morning. Maybe we can work on an email together that we send to everybody or something. We do have so. a meeting in the morning. Okay. And then did I hear any consensus on this or we're not ready for a consensus? Um, because I heard a couple things. I heard the fourth uh, to be the special meet. No, adding a special meeting on the 11th yeah. and pushing. Was there consensus on having the uh, public hearing and school committee vote on the 11th? And then on the fourth, as would opposed to the fourth, correct? correct? Yeah. Yes. I and at then least a week back, the yeah. superintendent's budget recommendation would be on the fourth. Is that what I heard? Some consensus. Or everybody and then, and then you can yeah. eliminate that additional meeting yes. because you can make that the fourteenth, right? right? Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the public hearing then is the eleventh. Yes. Yes. And we're so going to eliminate one of the December meetings. Right. Yep. Okay. Okay. Because okay. we only had one meeting in December originally, so that that would be nice. Okay. So we got there. Good. Okay. Thank you all very, very much. much. Um, okay, so now we're jumping Sorry, ahead. wait. Yep. <laughs> so we moved capital up a month, too. Oh, we, we didn't did. even talk about that. We did. Okay. Um, and sorry. I mean. My apologies. That's okay. No, it's I, big. With me, I just want to, yeah. Yeah, it's big. Um, I'm actually going to ask, ask um, Susan to speak to this. Okay. Um, we had, I was going to add in um, when Jean was listing all the things that you have go going on, we also have a new um, finance Director of Finance and Operations uh, with us, and it's her first year through with our, our school uh, district, but we also have a new Director of Buildings and Grounds, and so um, we have discussed at length what this would mean for capital and the fact that in a perfect world, to Mina's point, we would have started this back in July, but Tim only just started, had just started with us. So, um, Susan, do you want to just jump in and talk about what, you know, summarize our thoughts about capital for the upcoming year? Sure. Um, so part of this budget discussion with both Norman and, and Chris as well was the recognition that, you know, a well done 10 year capital plan would not fit within this timeline, seeing that both Tim uh, and I are new. Um, so we would really like to do a more comprehensive review of all the mechanical systems within the district and get our arms around the age and condition and where we actually stand with, with all of this and, and create a really more comprehensive 10-year plan. Um, so <coughs> recognizing the constraints, I said that it would, I had suggested that for this year we would be giving them a one-year capital plan. We're still working toward that 10 year, but to do it well, I think for this budget process, we'll do well that first year. So that's what we're fitting within this plan, and that's okay. 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 They're okay with that? And they were okay with that. Okay. They understand <laughs> but where, we, wanted, where we are. We want you to be okay with the proposal, and that's why I say I said we, were, we, we meant to bring this up with you. Um, I think what Susan says makes complete sense. Um, I know that something that I've heard from you for the past few years is that the 10-year capital plan feels like it's, you know, just being pushed forward that same amount of money and it's not really attached to anything except a, as a placeholder. And that you had asked that this year we bring a more comprehensive plan. Um, and it does feel already with the work that's been taking place that, um, you know, as Susan talks about reviewing all of the systems. She she means getting down into these literally, literally the, the room they call the dungeon at the Elmwood School that I didn't even know existed, um, and so I think it's great a great suggestion yeah. that you be presented with a really thorough ten year plan the following year, um, and that there are things that just really need to be addressed in the upcoming year that they've already identified. I do have one question about about that because I think one of the things that we have talked about a couple of times in different scenarios that is not on what our current tenure plan is, um, is 
paving field nine and fixing uh, widening yeah. the turnaround so that we can route the buses around behind the high school right. that will um, be in this year so i just want to make sure that we have time within this schedule to do whatever engineering yeah. study or whatever that we need to get a solid number to present at that yeah. time yeah that is part of what the proposal when we did the short-term solution to traffic calming mm -hmm. it was with the understanding that we needed more time to present a more thorough long-term solution which would include the paving and to just check in with you Susan that would still be the expectation that right. we have that yeah. in place. so Tim has been working toward that okay. and um, we had originally thought that buses could not fit behind there, but we actually brought a bus back there, so it nice. does fit. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> so, Told you, grassroots. She's out there with Did the you bus. drive it? Or Pro probably. You <laughs> I wrote it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but it, do, it does not include, so we can get a bus back there, which surprised all of us, actually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> surprised me. <laughs> but it, what we have not really put to put you know full thought is you have to create that safe barrier for the students right. to be walking. So right. that's another another um, piece to the puzzle. But it surprised all of us that the bus actually still fit even right now. Okay, so. can you just sure. see them? Get a bus. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I think it's. Fine. I like the idea that we were yeah. surprised by fitting the bus. There. Like, <laughs> what was the plan? <laughs> what was going to happen if it didn't work? Keep <laughs> 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 back up. Wow, I'm glad I wasn't there that day. Um, okay, yeah, I just wanted to make sure this allowed time to add because especially paving that parking lot has yes. been yeah. a big. That that was not on the plan originally. Right. So. Okay. Good point. Any other points to be raised? Okay. Thank you. All. Thank you. Um, so the cross country course completion of phase one. Yes, and we're going to turn this over to, to Susan. Susan. Okay. So um, the memo in your packet, as you can see, back in 2016, the cross country course that is being done throughout the campus. Phase one, which really incorporates um, the middle school loop, if you will. Um, the original approval from the school committee was for 35000 toward that phase. The total cost of phase one, I've uh, given you the budget within the packet as well. The total cost to complete that course is 65911 So between that 35000 and the and the 65000 total budget to, to do the, the course, we would need the authorization for that additional 30,911 to complete full for phase one. So to date, as you can see, 26,000 has been spent towards that original approval amount. So just looking to be able to move this forward. And again, the funding is the central office gift account. Does anybody have questions yeah, about that? Yeah, I have a couple of questions about, um, you know, is it right that uh, this funding is done through BAA and uh, the 26.2 mm -hmm. foundation? Is that right? So that so that's the money that is being contributed to the central okay. office gift account. I see. We mm -hmm. do have a 10-year agreement with them, Mina. Um, this is the second. I don't know how many times we've had this agreement yeah. with them, um, but monies that have been. Um, generated through those associations and there and it's a three-way agreement with the town that has been vetted through um, through the school committee all th also I guess through all three committees mm -hmm. um, one of the things that in the past um, it, this allowed the district to pay for for example were the bleachers at the over at the football field um, and so this is something that had been has been in place um, with monies being basically held in the gift account mm -hmm. Um, and you know the the estimates that were put forward. What is the betting process? Who all looks at it? Can you share some details about that? So with the person who is the clerk of the works, if you will, has designed similar um, running trails throughout the town. Okay. Um, so he's familiar with what this should cost to do various phases of the course. Okay. And so we've also shared it with a representative from the BAA. We have. Yeah. We have. Um, and one of the things that Susan had put in place and brought um, forward was, was a detailed <coughs> budget. Um, this is, had been a new project, Mina. These are wonderful questions. We didn't actually have the Clerk of the Works in place until kind of recently. a couple, months couple ago. meets right. ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so now that, and, and, and as you heard tonight, Kathy 
and Peter have been working very closely together and collaboratively together to make sure that the two projects coincide. Um, and I've been working with both of the groups to look at how can we meet the recommendations of the wetland um, requirement, uh, replication requirement, um, through these projects. At, and so that's all, those are all discussions that have been taking place over time. Um, but one thing that you will see, the school committee will see um, in detail for phase two is what, what's involved in phase two before the work begins. So, um, and, and how much that will be. And then you're seeking your approval before, you know, we're into the project. I think that you might have read about it in the paper before you heard about it here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think another thing I was mentioning is I would have li uh, liked the site uh, tour. Yeah. Just to understand everything better, but I did get a mini tour. Oh, today. That's right. did you walk it? Well, Mina did not have on the appropriate shoes. Oh, this <laughs> morning. <laughs> but we did go and look at where it is, right? Yes. So we're going to go back and walk it. It was very helpful yeah. because then it made all sense and just looking at the plants and stuff. Otherwise, you know, you're like, yeah, it's, you're, yeah. Right. it's much easier to get a visual. Are they using it right well, now? Well, we could hook you up with no. Dee on her tractor and you could yes. get a tour of the entire fields, Nina. Okay, I'm going to yes. love that. Okay, <laughs> we'll do it. We will do that. I think he still has work to do. I actually yeah. bumped into him. He was there on Labor Day working, moving rocks. I don't, instead of like on doing Labor it himself. Wow. Yeah, I, I guess he was laboring on Labor Day. But um, yeah, so, but he said, he needs to still there's still some work to do and then um, I think he's mentioned this to us before but he'll have some um, some people who do these courses regularly run it before the kids go on it just to make sure that there are no you know areas that aren't safe or don't work well or whatever so the testing part has not happened yet I'm sure we will all be invited oh to, yeah to We're run planning an event oh <laughs> yeah I'm just sure um, that would be a good visual for the paper. <laughs> yeah. If we can survive it. Jen would like to join the track to ride, please. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it's you'd have to take turns lining up like the kids do because it's only, it only takes one person at a time. Cart, right? But it is a golf yeah. cart, so we'll we'll make it. Jen, I've just added you to the list. We, we'll make that happen. Okay. <laughs> so any other questions about that? Are we ready for a vote? So uh, just just uh, that one person you talked about, mm -hmm. uh, you said, uh, what's the title you said? Clerk of the Works. Clerk, Clerk of, the, of works. the Works, okay. Right, so he, he reviews all the invoices, uh, ensures that we have received the labor that they're billing for. I so see. I don't process any invoices until sure. he's done the sign off and, and the review. I see, and so he, you know, there's a reasonability check on you know, what, what it takes by this person. Correct. Oh, okay. yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, are we ready for a vote? So I'm just looking for an, a motion to approve an additional $30,911 to complete phase one of the cross-country course to be funded through the central office gift account. So moved. And a second? Second. Um, okay, motion by Ms. Cavanaugh, second by Mr. Graziano. All in favor? Yes. yes. Anybody opposed? Or abstaining okay so that's unanimous um, thank you very much and we're on to our final field trip approval request um, final meaning that you have already approved the initial so this should be a quick item um, this is the uh, the trip for the overnight travel request for the varsity volleyball team they did bring an initial travel request as they should um, for something like this so that you at least were in agreement um, of the idea of it and then this form the final approval form basically gives additional information it's been approved by the principal and uh, recommended by the superintendent any questions about this one okay so I'm just looking for a motion to approve the final overnight travel request for the varsity volleyball team to travel to the International Volleyball Hall of Fame and Volleyball Classic Tournament in Holyoke Mass on October 8th, 2017, returning on October 9th, 2017. So moved. And a second? A second. Okay, so a motion by Ms. Cavanaugh, a second by Ms. Devlin. All in favor? Yes. 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 Anybody opposed or abstaining? Okay, so that's unanimous as well. Um, we're picking up speed. Additional English language learner teacher. Okay. So, 
In your packet, you can see there's a memo to Dr. McLeod. And this is in regard to our enrollment of L students during this current school year. Last year when we were in the budget process, we had 24 students join our L program, moving from the 16th school year to the 17th school year. And so when we were working with budget this year, we assumed we would probably have a similar number of students who had come in. Our October Sims report last year was 83. At the end of the school year, we were above 90 students. But that's because typically during the school year, especially in February, students will join our, our schools. And I can explain why. Um, but by the time we got to the beginning of this school year, we had our access scores that come back on May 31st. We had um, word from the state that even though they said that the threshold was going to be much lower for moving students out, they actually raised the threshold a little bit and we, we were able to move some of the students out of, of the program. But as you can see, over the last several years, things had been flat in 13, 14, 15, and then we are now up 102% in terms of our L population. So as we began looking at our student population this fall, uh, Jill Kimball, who is our L coordinator, uh, had come to me and said, we have 446 students who are newly registered. And that obviously includes our total incoming kindergarten group. And so as we looked at those students, we realized that 180 of those students were defined as floaties, which are students whose primary home language is something other than English. So that means that we need to screen each one of those students. And historically, what had been happening is about 25% of the kids uh, whom uh, we screen are um, are found eligible for L services. So we're really looking at about 45 additional students on top of that 83 if all of these numbers hold fast. I can, when I submitted this to Dr. McLeod, you know, it was obviously a week ago or maybe even longer that we had started working on these numbers. At this point in time, we are thinking that those numbers are probably going to be pretty accurate based on the kinds of screening that we have already seen. So we are really looking for an additional L teacher in the district. That means that we will have six L teachers for perhaps about 125 kids. Um, you can see that there are 66 students at center school and we are probably thinking about putting about 2.2 teachers um, there for those 66 students and um, it may make you wonder why we would then need so many teachers for our students at the high school at the high school we have students three students who are considered to be slife which means that they are students with limited or interrupted formal education. So they have come to Hopkinton and they may have great big gaps in their learning, which means that they not only need English language learner instruction, but they also need content instruction. And then what we've been able to do fairly successfully in past years is to group students who had similar um, access scores. So if a student was considered to be a level two, we could put them in with other level two students and give them, you know, two times 45 minutes a day. But what we're finding now is we can't match a SLIFE level two with um, a typical level two because a SLIFE level two needs not only language but content, and a typical level two would just need language. So in terms of scheduling, this has become rather complicated, and we are looking for one additional teacher. Um, I am hoping that these numbers will sort of plateau here, but I would be remiss if I didn't say that in a month or two months, I could be back here looking for you know, additional personnel to help us be able to best serve these English language learners. Um, but at the same time, it would be fiscally, I think, irresponsible to ask for that today because, you know, again, these are just projected numbers. So that's where we are with our L population. I would imagine it's only getting bigger in the next couple of years. In, then, uh, from what you said at the beginning, it sounds like we would expect more to come in after February. I think so. One of the things that um, I had shown the beginning teachers when I did the mentor training this summer, and one of the things that I had shared with the building principals, is if you look at uh, the DESE website in 2007, you'll see that Hopkinton at that point in time was probably 94% white and if we take a look at where we are today we are about 83 percent white and you can see you know sort of those other groups that have joined um, the Hopkinton public schools uh, but we are you know certainly a changing district you know culturally and, and I think that you know we have a little bit of catching up to do to realize what that's going to look like in in coming 
weeks, months, years. So. And why February? I think that's a very interesting Oh, fact. why February, yes. So last year we did gain a few students during the year, uh, probably in excess of 10. But we very often get students from South America in February because that's the beginning of their summer. So oh, school okay. has just finished for them. So if they move to the United States during their summer, then they are enrolled in our schools. The children essentially get no summer. My kids would mm -hmm. be so mad. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In terms of timelines, uh, when will these numbers firm up for you? We are hoping that all of our screening can be done, um, well, I would say probably a week from Monday. So, yeah. Okay, so fairly soon. It, yes. Okay. And, and just so you know, too, I mean, we, we still have students who are enrolling. You know what I mean? So every once in a while we'll look at those and we say, oh, there's another student who's primary uh, language spoken at home is something other than English and we screen that student as well. So the numbers I think it's interesting with the L population if we look at our general population it's pretty stable you know not from year to year but from week to week and month to month but with an L population it can change markedly in just a short period of time. Sure. You know if one student who is a slife decides to move out of the district that's you know, four periods a day that a teacher wouldn't be covering a particular student because SLIFE students would have four periods a day of L instruction and content instruction. Yeah, I'm certainly curious to understand um, L a little bit more. Yeah, uh, it's fascinating. Having come from, you know, my first language is not English, um, but, you know, it, to me, I'm as comfortable in English as I am in Hindi or Telugu. Um, so I'm just curious to understand the program a little bit better and, you know, the benefits of it and what happens. So perhaps some time with you would be helpful. Sure. Yeah. I would love to do that. It, you know, <laughs> so when we have a kid who comes in who's a level one, and if they are a young student, just naturally that student will go to level three, almost with or without instruction. But if we have students who are at the high school level, it doesn't work that readily. And if we have a student who's at level four, sometimes they just max out there without that kind of really explicit instruction because they've acquired as much language as they're going to get just in natural immersion. So it's really neat. But schedule a couple of hours if you're going to talk about <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it. You'll, you'll about get going. <coughs> so. right, that's good. That makes two of us. <laughs> Telugu, we have loads of students who speak Telugu oh, coming into right? the district. Oh, my God, yeah. I'm surprised you know the language. <laughs> well, learning new things every day. We always can use translators as well. All right. Yes, yes. yes. and that's good to know. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so um, I'm looking for a motion to an approve to approve. Oh, that, right, that I do have another question. Yes. So what, we're are we paying for this out of oh, right. salary reserve? So, oh no. Oh, uh, uh, pay? Okay. Yeah. I see it. Like, Appreciate okay. we add that the, at the bottom. The I think it's in the mm -hmm. motion. I think yes. oh, it's, it's not in the motion, in the motion on the, the agenda. Motion. Do you want to add that? I yeah. think you're right. It's in the memo. It's, it's in the, the it's at the bottom of the memo. Yeah. Yeah. Page two of the memo. Yeah, we should yeah. put it in the memo. Uh, prepaid except transportation. Okay. Um, so I will add that to be funded. Okay. Um, so I'm looking for a motion to approve an additional ELL teacher for the 2017-2018 school year to be funded through our prepaid except transportation account. So moved. And a second. Second. Okay, so a motion by Mr. Graziano, uh, um, second by Ms. Barath. Anybody, uh, sorry, all in favor? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Anybody opposed or abstaining? So that is unanimous. And thank you can you. start hiring, so that's great. Marvelous, <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, superintendent search. <sighs> um, so we have a lot of things in our packet and a few decisions, I guess, to make tonight to just get the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously everybody knows by now and has read Dr. McLeod's nicely worded letter about her retirement. So we're um, really sorry to see her go, but very happy for her to be much closer to family, which is the most important thing after all. Um, so we need to embark upon the difficult process of filling her shoes. So. What we started with was, um, you can see in your packet, the job description, the candidate profile, the timeline. Um, but I think it probably makes sense to start with 
the process that we've talked about about hiring a consultant so the last um, time that we did this we had a consultant a, a search firm that we worked with um, who helped us well helped us do some of the um, formulating candidate profile and all of that but um, really facilitated the search process in terms of helping us identify candidates, spreading the word, helping us advertise, um, and then helping us go through the actual interview process itself. So, but the, the requirements around that process have changed since then, and so you are definitely more articulate about this than I am. Um, in terms of how we go about hiring that firm, um, and the, the requirements on us have, are different now than they were the last time we did it. So maybe you can explain to them what our choice is, basically. Right. So the you have different thresholds that you have to be mindful in terms of cost. So if it's under $10,000, then you use what's considered sound business practices. And you can select the firm that you want to help or assist with the search. And then knowing that you are basically going to negotiate the scope that stays under that cost. If it is above 10000 but below 50000 then you have to solicit three quotes for your scope of services, and you will have to select the lowest um, bid for that. So there's a couple things to that, of course, with that. Timing is everything. You know, as, as you know, um, I think Kim put in a, a um, kind of an estimated timeline in here. Um, but if you have an idea of the scope of services that you would like to have, so some of the things that were done in the not too distant future when you or went through the process with Dr. McLeod, if that profile and that job description seem to be that it has not changed drastically in five years, then that's something we can use as a jumping off point as opposed to hiring a consultant and starting that whole process over, getting community input to do all that, because you did that five years ago. Um, so that it, it's a matter of determining that threshold, the scope of services that you want them to do. And if you're, if you're looking to move the process along and you're comfortable with that $10,000 mark and you're comfortable potentially with the firm that you are looking to use to uh, help facilitate um, the process can move along much faster. Right. Um, so basically, just in terms of context, I think the last time we did this process, um, the fee portion, which is the only part that's relevant to the bid, right, mm -hmm. not the expenses, the fee portion was around $13,000. So we're feeling like if we can, if, if we could vote to authorize Susan to negotiate with um, our search firm to work under the $10,000 limit, we could go we could go directly to that step rather than put out um, what's essentially an RFQ, I guess, yes. for bids, which then limits us to taking the lowest bid, which we actually did that. Uh, we went through this process twice the, when Dr. Phelan was re re retiring. We first went through the RFQ process and then realized that we needed to take the lowest bid and we were not happy with that firm at all. So we then restarted the process with an RFP, which gave us the ability to pick whatever firm we wanted um, within the scope of, of what we requested. And we ended up working with NESDEC. Um, and we worked with them again when we hired Dr. McLeod. We worked with them when we hired you. Um, mm -hmm. So we do have a history with them. We are a member of NESDEC. They do our enrollment traditions, which usually they're very good at. but. Um, and um, and we do get a discount for being part of their their um, a member. Thank you. <laughs> That's what I was looking for. So um, so we have a couple of choices. We can or or we could try to do this ourselves. But I I think that um, I mean Kim does a fantastic job and she does a lot of this work already in internally. Um, but I do think the advantage of you know the breadth that they have in terms of identifying candidates um, that we probably don't have internally is is important and adds some value um, as well as them helping us facilitate the interview process um, so I guess I would start with thoughts I think we need to make that decision and then maybe we can take a, t a look at the timeline um, 
to. But I think what, what Nancy and Kim and I had talked about is because we have done this job description and candidate profile so recently, the way that they helped us do that was through a series of, I don't know, six or seven public forums that they attended and ran. So that was a substantial amount of time. And I think that we could probably forego that. We could work on what we have and update it. And then we could send it out publicly for for input. We could certainly send it to our colleagues on the Board of Selectmen and other town um, departments and incorporate that feedback. And then if, if it seems like it rises to the level of needing to have a public forum to discuss it, we absolutely can do that. But rather than just scheduling six or seven that have one or two people each attending, it, that's a lot of money to invest. And that might be mm -hmm. the difference of getting us under that threshold was kind of what we were thinking. So I did, uh, just to offer, I did go ahead and get a letter from NESDEC just oh, to get great. some additional information. Um, so I will pass this out. On the cover, it gives you some of their options, if you will, a search outreach, a guided search, or a comprehensive search. So the comprehensive search is what you did in the, in the previous. So you can see what the costs are for that. And then on the back is kind of that timeline in, in those services that they offer. Really, this is really more along. Um, the first couple of things are really that comprehensive search. Okay. Um, so, but this gives you an idea. It can be, depending on you know, you know where you're looking at for a scope of services, it can be somewhere in between some of these. So, Jean, I think you asked for thoughts, and if you would indulge me for a couple of minutes first, I want to say that I'm very sad mm -hmm. that Dr. McLeod is leaving, and you know, I had certainly asked her, is there anything that we could do <laughs> that could change you your mind? <laughs> Uh, I just asked before the start of this meeting. She did. She did. She, 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 <laughs> she made muffins. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, because you have set the bar so high. Thank you. And so it's not going to be easy, no matter who we choose, Nestec or whoever. And um, so thank you for all that you have done. And thank you for giving the school district so much time. Yeah. To choose, you know, if we were short of time, it would be so much more difficult. So having, you know, the whole year, uh, it makes a huge difference. So thank you. Thank you. And and with regard to this, I guess I'm just wondering, um, how do these different um, organizations which help out with the search, how do they differ? You know, what is it that, I know there are a bunch of organizations, right? Mm -hmm. Is it purely based on, um, you know, the financial aspects that we would look at? Or is it the pool of people? How does it work? Mm. Well, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Can you answer that question? You know, I think they, they each have their, um, you know, their memberships, if you will, and the, the breadth with which people understand and know organizations that are doing these executive searches. Um, NESDEC is very well known. M most superintendents are connected to NESDEC in some fashion. So that's really one of the big powerful pieces that you're looking at. I wouldn't be able to answer what their um, affiliation is compared to, you know, another one, but I can speak for, you know, NESDEC is very well known. Mm -hmm. and, and to the point where a lot of the people we work with at NESDEC are former superintendents. Correct. So, mm. I mean, the, so then the, there's a network aspect to yeah. the, that's a, a lot of their, the employees that we work with there are, you know, have that role and so maintain those networks, so. My memory of the reason that we chose them so, so many years ago was um, they were not the lowest price, but they were very competitive. Um, compared to the lower price, we felt like they were much more professional in their presentation. Um, we definitely felt like the network that they had was broader um, than the than the other um, firm that was a lower price. And then there were two other firms that um, we interviewed, one of which was just very expensive. Um, and then the other of which was also more expensive, but honestly, we just didn't feel like we were a good fit in terms of like a working relationship with the people that came to present to us and um, we have and obviously since then have had a longer term relationship with NESDEC um, it's usually Art Betancourt and Carolyn um, Carolyn uh -huh. <laughs> Burke 
Burke, thank you. That um, that work with us, so they know our district really well. Um, they've they've been involved with us several times over the last year, so I feel like they they do have a comfort level with the district. And I can speak from a superintendent's perspective in terms of just having confidence in um, receiving a search that is being run by NESDEC. Um, one of the things that they do, and I don't, I can't speak to other firms, but um, they will. They will really counsel superintendents in terms of whether it's a good match in, in terms of encouraging this is a good place for you to be applying um, knowing your background and where you've been and then what the district is looking for um, is something that they really do with their pool of candidates as well uh, and i think that's something to think about oh that's great yeah mm -hmm. that's great any other thoughts I think if this organization was connected to finding you, Kathy, right, and, and you too, Susan, or no? Both, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there, for sure there are other options, but if they were able to find good matches in two out of the, you know, m few major administrative roles, leadership roles, I, f I feel like using them again, taking what we already have, and trying to you know match that ten thousand ish number um, using what we have would I, I feel like that makes a lot of sense what you yeah. suggested so I mean if anybody else is for it I think that I, you, you know I would support that mm -hmm. as okay. a way to move forward I mean I think given the change in the um, in the process we we have a good idea of what we can get with NESDEC if we if we don't go this route, the next level is essentially the RFQ. That means that we're going to take whatever is the lower right. bidder, and that may not be. Maybe it would be a, a you know um, a hidden gem, but it's unlikely. I, I just feel like we have. Um, I don't. This isn't going to come out right, but better the devil you know. Like we <laughs> we definitely know that we have a good <laughs> relationship with them, and and as you pointed out, we've been very successful in our t two most recent searches with them. Um, so, so I mean, I think I think it's a good decision to try to move forward. It, looking at this, do you all have a preference in terms of the actual service that we are these the um, the prices for <coughs> the members? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is after the twenty percent discount. Yes. So we'd be likely looking at the guided search, is that? Yeah, and unless there are one or two a la carte options from right. the, from the uh, comprehensive that we felt like Hold we needed down. to right. add in. Um, and just again to reiterate, their expenses in terms of I don't know, postings or making copies or any of that, that's not included in this. So you, you will see bills for that that will be beyond the $10,000. but. So I can't really tell the difference between the guided search and comprehensive search based on just this little description. Right. Looks like the search consultant. Is that the difference? It, it says Kim, Kim, Kim could not be here tonight, um, but she said this, basically said the same thing, which was that she believes that you'd be looking at something between the guided and the comprehensive that would be a la carte based on what the district needs um, on top of what she is already providing um, to avoid overlap. Mm -hmm. and Which is similar to... And it's not answering your question, Mina, but it's to, re to respond that, yeah, sorry, John. Uh, I, which is similar to, I think, what we did with the, the search that yielded uh, Susan. It was, yes. it was, we don't need everything Correct. in comprehensive, but mm -hmm. we want things that are a little bit more than guided. So I think mm -hmm. these are sort of guideline yeah. packages if you will but we and can negotiate the specific services with and them. The, that's right that John and the this. dollars come into basically their time Mina and yeah. that's why they're saying they're giving these ranges and it comes down to how much time they spend both inside and outside the district to compile the information provide it back to us and then meeting with uh, various search committees sure. so no. I think if you look at this list on the back I mean just based on having gone through this process before and and also recently um, you know developing the brochure and the ad I think again that's something like the candidate profile that we could do you know Kim we could work with Kim to 
update what we have done. We may have even updated that for your search. I don't even know, um, or for yours. But we um, we could update that. Uh, certainly, we want their support publicizing the vacancy and recruiting. The community needs assessment. That was what I was referring to before. I don't think we need to do that again. I think we can um, attack that a different way. Um, and then their review, uh, all of the rest of this, I think, is included in all of the options, right? The, the community needs assessment is going to probably be a significant expense. I feel like that's the budget buster yeah. if we take that was it out. The six meetings. Yeah. yeah, that's probably expensive for them to get yes, exactly. six meetings. Yeah, and then compiling compile all that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so Jean and John, have you you two have been through this process before? Is that mm -hmm. right? Um, so, do you recall like how rigorous was it? Do you know um, which option we may have chosen? I think we probably did somewhere between. <coughs> well, I think we did comprehensive last time. I see. Based on the range, um, we didn't do the strategic leadership. We already have a strategic plan, and sure. so we didn't. I think it was the comprehensive. So again, it, we spent for Dr. McLeod's search. It was no. The one before it, oh, yes, it was free. that was free. For uh, for the <laughs> Tell one, him why? It was a, well, <laughs> and that's the other thing. You, I really hope we never ever have to do this again. But it comes with a guarantee, and so that's why Dr. McLeod's search was free. Um, right. What's the guarantee? <laughs> that just <laughs> that'll just, work out. <laughs> it doesn't work out for some reason. For well, how long? The, the person that we originally hired. I know you're, you're getting you're getting <laughs> help on the guarantee. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't I don't remember what the contract is. Was it a full year? I oh, yeah. just okay. a year. Okay. Yeah. The, the person that, or may it, may it, maybe it had been the entire first contract, but it, there was there there was they were absolutely right there with us when our Excellent. our first the person that we first hired resigned, and then we needed to. Um, obviously do the search again so that was that was free because of their guarantee um, and so so now if we hire NASDAQ um, any applicant would have to come to us through NASDAQ no and that's the other thing thank you that's important Kim said that she really could post this anytime and you know her advice really is that as far out in front of this as we can be um, the better situated we are in terms of attracting a good pool of candidates. And as you pointed out, Kathy did us the kindness of giving us a tremendous amount of notice. So it's really set us up well to be out in front of other districts. I think maybe there's only one other posting right now, and that's for an opening in January. So we would be, um, you know, at the front of the line. Um, so, but yes, yeah, so Kim can post, they will post places. So those aren't mutually exclusive, and we don't have to wait to hire them um, if we want to. For Kim to go ahead and post whenever she feels like it's the right time to do that. So whether we go through NASDAQ or not, we do have to give them the fee. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. No. No, if we don't. No, we if hire sorry, we whether we hire through, like if we hire a candidate, that, so this it's not like oh. a, it's not like a headhunter firm. Right. So it's not like it where where if if we hire a candidate that they didn't bring us, we're not going to owe them any money. No. There, there's a whole scope of services Correct. that they're going to okay. do here around the search that we'll still owe them for right. even if we don't. That's right. It's not like a it's not like a like yeah. a, a business executive search firm. Mm -hmm. it, just, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank no. You. Good question. Um. Anything else? Any other thoughts? I think this makes sense. Okay. So why don't we take care of this part at least? Um, and I think and you would be the one that could negotiate this for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just need a motion um, to authorize Susan Rothermick to um, negotiate with NESDEC for um, up to $10,000. I don't know what else I mean. Um, for a superintendent search process. Does that cover it? Do we, do we need to identify the funding source? I would use that prepaid accept okay. again. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll add that. I don't think again. we need to identify the funding source because you're going to negotiate it and then <coughs> come back to us for the contract award, right? Um, I can. I kind of feel like we should. Okay. Does it okay. That's fine. Maybe, can we target to do that at our next meeting? 
sure. to award the contract. Mm -hmm. Okay, I th that's probably a better transparency in terms of steps and, and whatnot. Um, okay, so did that work for you? It does. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, so I just need a motion. So. And a second. Second. Okay, so a motion by Mr. Graziano and a second by Ms. Cavanaugh. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? Okay, so thank you. And then, um, so let's also just have a, a quick conversation about the rest of this, just based on Tim, Kim's um, timeline. Um, we do have the job description um, and the ideal candidate statement in our packet. Um, so she's, she is identifying that we should be working on that in early September. So I guess what I would say is on that regard, since we can't discuss it offline and it will be excruciating if we sit here and wordsmith it with all five of us, why don't we each send our suggested edits to Kim and she can have it in our packet, in our next packet, and then we can, um, we can discuss it more fully at that point. This is it the profile, Jean? The profile, and I don't know that we really need to weigh in on the job description. I just of, reviewed it. It looks pretty. pretty is that good. what you do every day? It does. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, but yeah, I think the candidate profile, why don't we all look at what's in this packet, send our edit, I mean, I assume that's okay with Kim since yep. she's not here. Um, send our edits to Kim by, when do we put things in the packet? It would be... It would be a week from Friday, the in, the in between week. So but she needs time to turn it around. How about is Wednesday reasonable? Yep. Sure. For everybody? So, um, I just want to call out something. I did look at that, and it does look very comprehensive. The one thing that I wanted to call out was it talks about hiring great talent. Mm -hmm. I think one of the key things for the next person coming in would be to retain. Mm -hmm. as well okay besides you know the hiring and, and the existing administrative mm -hmm. staff yeah. which is awesome yes we like them right That's so a good point. so that was one thing I just wanted to call out okay but I will send it to Kim too perfect yeah Thank all you. of those things and I do think there's a section um, that talks about in their first year the superintendent will do X Y and Z one of which was um, build the center school so we could take that out but well, we that, can just put Elmwood in yeah we can substitute that's actually what I did on my um, but but I think um, take a particular note of that section and what you think the highest priorities are for the next superintendent coming in that things that they're gonna have to jump right into um, so okay so if we can all send those to Kim by Wednesday and you'll let her know I will thank and you we'll get it in the next packet um, and then I think Kim um, the recruiting brochure hopefully she can help us update that and and try to have that in the next packet as well um, and then the next thing on here is to start populating the screening committee so um, I think that's the, probably the only other thing that we need to talk about tonight um, so that we can take an action next week um, next meeting but that the next yes thank you at the next meeting what um, and she gave us a list of who was in the last screening committees um, and they were a little bit different um, with a lot of overlap so what I thought we might do tonight <coughs> is just get a preliminary sense of what we think the makeup of the committee should be and then um, I already have had emails from two people in the community asking to be on the screening committee so for whatever how whatever number of public seats we designate I think we should also talk about what will be the application and interview process for those people um, so that we can finalize that decision at our next meeting and be ready to go um, so that we're we're really ready to get started and I think if we could give people an idea of the time commitment before yes. they apply because That's some people point. might be interested in right. it but might not have the availability to yes and I think we could ask uh, we could work with Kim to um, maybe create an application that had that information in it as I remember it it was probably three or four all-day meetings one to review all the resumes and then two two or three to interview all of the initial candidates 
and then a final one for the screening committee to make their recommendations for finalists to the school committee. And then at that point, we really take the process over and we will do the interviews, the reference checking, the site visits, all of that. Um, so the screening committee's work is substantially done at that point. But if I, does that sound right to you? I would say it was probably three or four full days um, that, that it was a commitment. And obviously, it's an entirely confidential process for anybody that isn't named a finalist who would never um, discuss their names publicly. Um, so that's the other thing that needs to be included in the application. So did anybody have thoughts just looking at the last two screening committees about what you'd like to see in terms of, is there anybody that we've left off? Is there? Um, we do have the uh, someone from the Board of Selectmen, right? We did do that um, when we hired Kathy, and I think that that was a very good um, addition to the committee. I would, I, I think that that's a good one to retain. Do we have at large parents as well, or is it just we didn't do it that way? What we we had, <clears throat> I think the way we did that was to send invitations to the school councils and say please pick a representative. Or when you when the first time we sent an invitation to the PTA and the HEF to say work together to come up with one person to represent the parent community. Um, so we could do those kinds of things. Or I, I think given that we've already had independent people email us from the community, I'd really rather open it up. And we can advertise right. to all of those groups that they can apply. Um, but rather than us picking the high school council over the community right. at large, I think that would that would be one change that I would recommend. Well, particularly we have interest enough that people are ahead of the, the, the one curve. thing though that I do just want so do we want to establish for community members though to that point do we want to establish not roles but specializations so like do we want to have I mean it can be so we don't have to necessarily go to the school councils to say provide us with a middle school representative do we want to say we want one secondary parent we want one elementary parent mm -hmm. we want one at large community member mm -hmm. and i think it would make sense to designate that just so we make sure we've got I think the full right. gamut yeah. of community yeah. members because if we get three really qualified community members who all fill one spot what do right. we do yeah no i think that that's good and i do right. think it would be good we did both <laughs> times um have somebody from cpac and i think, I think that that's, that's important. important um so i'm going to start so i like what you just said john about um, we did both times. I think there's one oh, missing community member. There's one, one missing from one, there. One secondary, one elementary, one at large, one from CPAC. Um, in terms of a uh, one board of selectmen. Mm -hmm. um, the two other sort of categories that I thought about that we didn't include before, but I thought might be worth considering are somebody from the Appropriations Committee and or um, Denise Hildreth, who is our, who we did not have a Director of Youth and Family Services at the time, but I feel like she really has, she works really closely with the school department mm -hmm. um, and has a really good feel about what's happening, you know, across the community that perhaps we don't see every day. Yeah, and she also comes across as very even keel. Yeah. So you want us also represented mm -hmm. well. Right. to the candidates right so I, I, I think that would be good I like the idea of Denise Hildreth I think given her her role and her experience the way she's jumped into the role in the town and and obviously the obvious parallels especially for all the things we talk about with the social and emotional right. components of the school mm -hmm. um, I, I would say I, I the appropriations I don't feel as appropriate for this no pun intended. Um, just because I, I feel like that that's a role that works probably more on the specifically on the financial side with with Susan's office. I, I okay. it, it feels sort of a little too singular for for this. Okay, no. but you're still comfortable with the board of selectmen. Oh yeah, no, I think that's okay. I, I think that I think that one's a must have. All right. All right. So now we have six people, and we haven't Can't talked about it. anybody in the schools. Gotta be an odd number. I, you need it's to gotta be an odd number. Yeah. Yes. I don't Would see you? them. Who's that? Well, yeah, that she wasn't on it. They, um, they weren't on it before. Susan. It's on the. I do see director. Well, it's yeah. on the it's on the second so there's two. One. There's it's two on the lists. One. It's on yeah. the second one. On yeah. The second one. I think the way they did it, Kim just pulled the administrators to see um, yeah. who who wanted right. to do it. There were three we, administrators. It yeah. like. Yeah. But it's such a close relationship. Yeah, I think that that's a good um, suggestion, if you're comfortable, since we're Sorry, putting you on the spot. 
<laughs> I've done this before. Okay. Um, well, that would be good. So maybe um, we, I would, and obviously Kim, mm -hmm. um, I probably would defer to Kim on the balance of the additional administrators. I think we definitely need at least one elementary and one secondary teacher. I, I, so I think we need, I, so I agree with you on the teachers. I, I would say I'll defer to Kim on the administrator with the exception that I think we, I, I feel like we should have one principal. Mm -hmm. I feel like okay. having a, a, <coughs> building, a building manager sort of role okay. for it, it, that I think would be important to this in terms of their, their work with it. And I would, with, I, I personally, I would be comfortable with the, sort of the, the professional community those principals have of just saying to them, Pick one. you guys work out. Well, it is. So then, given that we've already said Kim and Susan, do you want to? Is one principal enough? Additional uh, administrators? I think so. Again, this is just me. I think so. Again, just personally, I think so because I've mm -hmm. seen how they work together. Okay. So I don't think I, I don't think we necessarily need a wide swath from the principals. I think one could represent the group. Okay. I, I feel, two, in my personal opinion, two would be good. Uh, but at the same time, what if someone that we are talking about here is looking to apply? Right. So what happens in that instance? Well, then they will they decline the opportunity to be on the school okay. committee. Yeah. Um, and then we haven't talked about school committee members, but we've had two in the past, which I think is probably um, good. So if we don't add the second principal, that gives us 13 people. So you know, it adds up really fast. Big. Yeah, yeah it big. adds up really fast. Um, it, right, did I do that right? Sec, um, three parents, well, four parents, a board of selectmen member, Denise Hildress, uh, Susan, Kim, an elementary teacher, a secondary teacher, a principal, and two school committee members. Is this typical? We had <coughs> 11 on one and 13 on the other. Does everybody have an equal vote? Mm -hmm. Yes. You have four parents and only one administrator. We have three administrators. I mean, one building-based administrator. Okay. So maybe Just that's not balanced. It doesn't feel very balanced to have four parent votes. Well, we've got. Where is so each parent? We've from? got. So we've got one one building-based administrator, but then we also have the two teachers and. Yeah. Yeah. You feel like that's. I, I just. Bad. I was just making quick notes. So if you had four parents and how many um, community people? The, that's it, right? The parents well, are the... Well, unless oh. you consider the Board of Selectmen or Denise the community. No, right. So that's two from outside of schools, just two? It's basically six from outside the school and seven from within, if you count school committee members. Well, also, let me see what Kim thinks about this. Yeah. And so we'll bring this recommendation back in the packet for next time and then we can all let this percolate a little bit more yeah um, too but I think we have a good start on it and um, and so we won't be sending any invitations tonight so <laughs> so no worries so I think that that was a good starting point um, and I'll talk to Kim afterwards and we'll get prepared for the next meeting in terms of getting all of this stuff in the packet so we can really make some final decisions at our next meeting and then be ready to go um, can I, can I also just ask from a, and it doesn't necessarily, although it sounds like we're going to have something at the next meeting, but um, it, this may naturally happen anyway in the chair report, but I feel like from now until we've named a candidate that this should be on sure. every agenda. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. So um, just, the, the, the should, you know, so we can have some update or discussion about progress. Yeah, no, I totally agree. That's a good point. And, I, and in the meantime, all of us should be thinking about what we think is the right balance of the five of us to be on the committee as well. We have some, um, I don't want to say old, more <laughs> experienced, <laughs> experienced, more long-term members and some more new-term members. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, a balance of both is probably really good. Um, so at any rate, so be thinking uh, about that. So to that point, I will say, and not that we have to go with past practice, but I think for these searches, we have also, generally speaking, <laughs> you haven't expressed interest yet or not, but we've always sort of defaulted to having the chair on the committee. That's true. So I just for for for, for um, and I think one of the reasons is because obviously the chair has that experience in working directly with the superintendent. <coughs> um, so just something to, to keep in mind as we think about that. <laughs> Thanks I know a you lot. <laughs> <laughs>
No, yeah, that's I. I Notice you didn't give the fine. news before you. That's fine. But mm -hmm. became chair. I know. I know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would have done it anyway. Okay. okay. All right. So are we good on that topic? Yeah. All right. So maybe we can make up a little ground because once again, I'm not keeping us on time. Um, okay. So school committee policy. Thank you, Susan, for all of that. Um, school committee policy. J H attendance. First reading. So I have questions on this. Um, right. May I know uh, the reason why we have added the chronic or long-term illness and also struck out the serious illness in the family? Yes. So, sorry, can, can, so just from a, a general standpoint, c can we get just yeah, a sense of, like a, a, before we get into questions, All right. yes. a sense of, okay. of what the purpose of this policy coming was and, and what the, you know, why we did it? Um, I had to just, my head was all in the search. I'm sorry. <laughs> Are you going to apply? I have to readjust now. <laughs> <laughs> sounds, that sounds like a great opportunity, so I'm just kind of distracted. Um, so um, this, this policy originally came uh, up for reconsideration because of some inconsistencies in the ways in which principals were um, reporting with the new student information system. It's also something that we've taken up as with principals as part of admin council over the past couple of years because of the difficult mm -hmm. position it puts principals and families in with the requirement that we have that after seven unexcused absences we are in a position of potentially having to report them to the attendance officer. And because of that we need to be very careful about what we consider excused and unexcused. So the discussion, we've had legal counsel, we had, it came up, one of, one of our uh, legal, uh, one of our lawyers came to one of the admin council meetings. Um, we looked at the letters that have been sent home to parents that are not particularly friendly um, and, and can, you know. <laughs> the letters, not Nancy, the parents. Nancy, how do you feel about the letter? <laughs> not particularly not, friendly. Not that friendly. <laughs> um, and so that, this is a, a policy, let's see, when did we last review it? Back Again, back in 2015. The reason it's up again is because with the new student information system, sometimes things are reported at the secondary level in a different way than they are at the elementary level. And this one around chronic or long-term illness is the distinguishing factor. So if a child has a cold and cannot come to school and is being kept home or has the flu, that is unexcused that is not an excused absent, as defined by policy, because the policy would allow seven of those to happen without. So, so just so I understand the difference between the yeah. excused and unexcused. Yeah. So, um, you know, in any event, if your child is absent, you call the nurse and you tell yes. them. Yes. Right. So, uh, so what's the difference here? Right, so it doesn't count towards this policy. If you exceed seven unexcused absences, I think after three you get a letter. After five. Five you get a letter, after six you get a, you know, a meeting. Um, the, the school district is required, the administrative team, to make sure that children are attending school. Of course. And of course, you know, it can be really difficult and very sensitive situation um, for the family as well as for administration when parents are making decisions on behalf of their children but and also when administrators are put in a position of needing to protect children and so this policy in, is in place because of that fine line and the uh, the policy that this school committee is following looks at uh, chapter 76 the requirements of chapter 76 um, which really requires that the attendance officer investigates cases so the number of absences that are allowed, that are excused, are if a child fails to attend school for seven full day sessions or 14 half days, that are, unexcu or, that are unexcused. So, sorry, correct, unexcused. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if your child, again, if your child has a cold or has the stomach flu, that is not unexcused. They, they are it's double it's, negative. It, in addition, I though, am I'm getting the two of them completely confused. Right, it is unexcused. It does. It counts towards the seven. Seven. The, the thing, and, and we did discuss this a little bit 
beforehand that I struggle with is there the inconsistency also lies in some of the things that children are not allowed to be at school for, and, and nor should they want them to be strep throat, right. Uh, right. vomiting, things right. of that nature. Right. And there is, I know, a, a bank of seven days, so to speak, but there are years when children are just more ill than others, yes. or they have other in. Yes. That's, I, I, I understand that. I know that <coughs> in the practical application of the policy is there is some ability for the building principal to look at it and to say, oh yes, I know that you know, you're able to provide documentation, <coughs> excuse me, that your child was sent home from school for in fact having a fever or mm -hmm. whatever it is and that it would not go to that reporting stage, but it, the policy itself, the way it reads, really is inconsistent with practice. practice. So uh, the, these are seven days in the school year. Yes, and then it starts fresh the following year. Not consecutive, but no. overall. Right. And on average, it's based on that, you know, averages. On average, you know, that would be for an average child to miss more than seven days for various illnesses. Mm -hmm. That's why we call out the chronic or long term that has doctor certification. Those are excused. So if they you don't count. So if you have a doctor's certificate, yes. so for instance, if my child has the flu, right? And has a doctor's note to say that they've been out for seven, five days with the flu, then you would submit the note um, and you would get those, those illnesses, chronic or long-term illness. Um, the administration would have the opportunity to consider that as excuse. So there's judgment that goes into this policy as well. Okay. I think there's, I, so I will say, I think that there's, and this is this is very tricky and yep. as Facebook discovered last year, a policy that's open to a lot of people's opinion despite the fact that it's based in law. Yeah. Um, it, I, but I think that it, it allows sufficient mm -hmm. sort of reasonableness. So when you get down to the attendance officer, it says, that that if a child fails to attend school for seven full day sessions or 14 half day within any six month period, the supervisor of attendance may file a complaint yep. in court against the parent. And it also says that they're required to investigate all cases brought to his or her attention by the principal when the student fails to attend school regularly. So as much as we have to send <laughs> that that less than friendly letter when, when right. he hit a, a certain threshold, it, it, it does feel like there is room in here that we're not, you know, that we're not going to be penalizing people when in the instance like you just described, a, a child just happens to have a year where they get the stomach flu on seven non-consecutive days, right, which sounds horrible. But, but, but that yeah. is a good example and I'll use it. And again, this is extremely sensitive. But if you have four children and one is having a difficult year with their health, but all four stay home. Right. That's a whole different conversation, and the oh, schools are yeah. required to, you know, be able to help the family. Is it a transportation issue? Is, you know, is, is the parent in a situation when, when they're tied down with one child, they just can't get the others to school because they're not getting bus It allows the principal then to make, and we are mandated reporters, as of course you know, um, so there are, in that regard, we don't even often question. We, we let other authorities look in, too. Um, any allegations or concerns that the school official might have um, about negligence or abuse or any of those kinds of things. And it, do, it doesn't get messed up in this, but it, it's related in the sense of the responsibility that we have to make sure that kids are attending school. Mm -hmm. I think, and I, I don't think this, I don't think this necessarily belongs in policy, but to, to that <laughs> point, it's if we could somehow get across to parents the idea, it says in here that the, the parents shall provide an explanation for a child's absence or tardiness, which may sort of by policy cover it, but my, my point more is if you're having a problem, call. Yeah. Right? Well, the school wants to work with the parents yes. in order to resolve the situation yeah. and either make the appropriate accommodations or, in best case scenario, get the child to school. Well, it says so, right here, John, doesn't it? Other <clears throat> exceptional reasons with previous approval of the school's principal. Yeah, it just somewhere it's like we. This needs to be a two-way conversation when yeah. these things come up before we send said letter. That's right, and the other part of this policy that provides um, support really for for the principals is that they do know, they do know the kids mm -hmm. and they do know the families, and they do want to be able to help um, and assist in this regard. 
this. The language is strong around um, it is a crime for a responsible parent not to cause a child to attend school. Um, and I think that it is something that principals, with the letter aside, Nancy, and that's a really good point, and we do need to keep revisiting that because if parents continue to feel that this is not a um, that it, this is not approached in a sensitive manner, then that's another whole problem that is outside of the policy. Yeah. But, uh, and I think, you know, the, the language is strong, but again, I think it's important to remember that the language isn't ours, it's, right? It, Even though right. it's in the policy, it's the law. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's... Right, it, it is. So, so I think that that's, um, yeah, I, th I think that's where, where sometimes the, 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 the school district bears the brunt of sort yeah. of the, the, the viewpoint on this. Yeah. Um, I, I do think, I mean, just, and I know you said that council was involved, so from that point I also would have even less input, but the actual changes that were made make sense to me. And this was um, yes. definitely including them. I'm gonna, did you want to add something, Carol? I know you were at all those conversations. I was, and having been an assistant principal for five years in charge very largely of sending those letters to parents, um, I do know that the the language is strong, the language isn't ours, but I do like that fifth bullet because the exceptional reasons, I think, is where we can hang our hat on this particular policy. So if a parent calls and says, I'm going to be out of town for two days because I have a very unwell mother and, you know, life is hanging in the balance, I need to take my children, that's a place where a principal could say, I'm going to excuse those absences. If a parent calls and say, we have an opportunity for this great ski chalet, we're probably not excusing those absences. So, I mean, I think, you know, right, not course. to be facetious about it, but I think that that's really where, you know, in, in a, a district sort of of this caliber, that's where we're, we're sort of having those issues, you know, and it really did come up when we had the new student information system. Like, how is it that we sort of document all of these things, mm -hmm. you know? So, Dr. Kavanaugh, I'm, you know, it looks like we still <coughs> have room for that, and so I don't quite Thank understand you. why we are striking it out. The what serious th illness in the family That's part? right. I mean, yep. I personally went through something like that, and for me to have to travel where I had to, it was, you know, I did go and speak with his teacher, my, my child's teacher, and the principal, and the office, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And that's the process that I followed. But to me, it's important yes. that it's not just bereavement. Yes. Right. Uh, because there are instances when it's end of life, or whatever it could be. Yes. And, and it's not an easy decision on the parent's part to decide to take the child out of right. school and take them with you. Agreed. I think the other piece of that, the illness in the family, is so if I have two children and one has been sick for three days, I just don't send the other to school, I could argue illness in the family. So I think that that might be one of the reasons why, you know, we were using that for multiple applications. Or, or to the point, I mean, I, yeah, I think that I that's... I do understand that, what you're saying. Yeah. Though, I don't want to be insensitive. Sure. Leaving it documented in there, I think, as, as a specific... I think you want to be careful about the ones that you do specifically spell out. So in a serious in, illness in the family, I mean, it... it a serious illness in the family, as defined there, might not require travel, right? It could be a serious illness in the family of someone who lives in a house. And so, you know, the, the, then the question, so, but if you have it in there, then it's, I can use it to mean anything. Whereas you still have the other exceptional reasons. Right, uh, but, but again, like I said, to me, it's, I don't know, uh, by striking it off, if we are helping ourselves in any way. And likewise, how do you define long-term illness? Is it four days, mm -hmm. seven days, 15? That's a good question. Right. That's the part I think that I, it, because when you look at the flu being, a, <laughs> excuse me, because you've been to the doctor in uh -huh, five days, but uh -huh. you also go to the doctor for a whole host of other things. Uh -huh. Is it within the purview of what would be le acceptable with a lawyer to say uh -huh. illness excused by a physician? Well, that's what we wanted to get away from. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, because, and, and you know, we, we just have to always be careful about about um, expressing things around this, but but it can be easy to get notes um, from physicians, depending on you know what what the situation is, and then the administrator is faced with you know so I have a note and I don't have any relationship with the doctor. I know the family, but I, I'm constantly getting these notes, just giving permission, and you know then that is just excused. And then that removes the level of responsibility and decision making from the administrator because now we're giving that decision making to an unknown physician 
and that node is what we're using. It's the child's physician. It is. I guess I would struggle with whose judgment yeah. I would trust more about the child's health. And True enough, Nancy. And the thing we struggle with is how, how easy or difficult is it to get those notes? And I, I don't have young children, so I wouldn't know. And, sure. and I think this is more a problem with parents with younger children yeah. with the sicknesses and whatnot. That's why this came up because of the differential between the middle and the and the the elementary and the secondary level. De definitely. Right. One of the difficulties is that you're trying to find language that applies to everybody K to twelve. And so I think that this was sort of that place where everyone could live with this language and had an understanding of what it meant. But, but your comments are well taken. Why, yes. you know, what does long-term mean? How many days? Wouldn't it be better defined by a doctor's note? That, that language by, around a doctor's right. note was not in here, I don't believe. It's not like that that was replaced. Yeah. No, it was not. I'm just, I'm looking, thinking of the chronic or long-term, which is looked at as how, how are we defining that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how are we deciding? We are it's vague to leave in a policy. Definitely. I mean, <clears throat> this is your policy, and we are open. This is really here tonight as a suggestion so um, for, your, for, your, for your input so that we can. can so I is the previous version just illness? Sorry. No, is, is, ahead, was it just illness or quarantine? I, I believe so. That's why yeah. it's said said illness right, or quarantine. Or illness or quarantine. Mm -hmm. So I understand that. Then I understand the, the desire to try to make, because illness is a sick day, mm -hmm. right? Right. Mm -hmm. But the, the practice that they were using was not just any illness because it, it, it right. was that it, it had to be a long term anyway. I think this reflects what was actually happening. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. <clears throat> Which what we have, and I think we brought this up in a policy discussion, that um, there's a policy for communicable diseases as well, which suggests that students and staff affected by short term infections or chronic diseases may not, it may not be appropriate for them to come to school. Right. So that's the tricky balance. Mm -hmm. So there's two different messages from two different policies. Hmm. Yeah. And I'm not sure that that policy is cross-referenced, Jen. It may. Uh, it, uh, what's the is J? it? Mm -mm. No. I have too many windows no, open. It's not. No. no, it's not. It's, I, I mean, I <coughs> cross-referencing, I think, highlights the inconsistency. Right. Correct. No, <laughs> I, but I'm just saying, as we take this up, let's right. make sure that we cross-reference J. Is it JH? The one that we're talking about right now is JH, and then the one that talk, discusses communicable diseases is um, <laughs> GBEB and um, JLCC we, for we students and this. staff. It's we did. We talked about this one, I think, yeah, because yeah. it's very GBEB. I, I um, think we might want to reference it, though. Um, I think it, that provides... Right. Well, because you don't want a kid to come to school with stress. So in theory, you would want that to be an excused absent because please stay home and don't infect the other 22 you would. or 24 I, I, kids or 28 sure of your things center, I yeah. don't wish my child And it exactly. might not be either chronic or long-term. Mm -hmm. Correct. Just contagious. Have Correct. You, but doesn't that you? fall into the other exceptional reasons, though? I mean, if you, I mean, my kids had one year where between them they had like yeah, actually 12 yeah. cases of strep throat. Somebody was always. Mm -hmm. But based on Nancy's experience, it doesn't, because it's not called out as when you call and you say my kid has strep. No, I know, but it, I mean, I'm saying, isn't that one of those times where you could reach out to the principal and say, you know. Oh, I've already been asked in seven days, <coughs> but yeah. here's I eight. Mean, do we, what if we add the word contagious? Yeah, but then, you, then, then you're sick days again because right. a cold's it's, contagious. It's tricky. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think easy. my real objection is not so much with the policy, but in looking at a piece that's beyond the policy and how it's how it's applied with what's going out, what the message is to parents. Because I do think it's important to look at the kids who are not going to school for reasons that would not really be mm -hmm. when there's a problem that the parents mm -hmm. need help with mm -hmm. or whatnot that the school mm -hmm. could provide. But to look mm -hmm. at then <coughs> how are the principals reaching out to the, and not the principals, because I don't think it actually is the principal that reaches out. I think it's the assistant principals. Not that I'm experienced or anything, um, <laughs> and the guidance counselors, but to look at what message they're sending. In some cases, I think there are, that, that, that there's an actual conversation that happens with mm -hmm. families. Okay. So uh, I just went to MASC and pulled up a couple samples, and they reflect our old language. Mm -hmm. They do. 
which I'm not saying that so we should go he, back to our old language. I just think it it's interesting. Right. We took it up because yeah. of our new student information system and the requirements and the language in that that asked us to look at, were, were these the... Were these the choices, chronic and long term? Is that why oh, is you had to choose one oh. of those indicators in the new in okay. the new attendance? Do you remember? So they had oh, to so this is the taking student the information right system. Out of there. Okay, that okay. should be Maybe easy to one. fix on the system. <laughs> the drop down uh, manner. Our school can add another contagious. <laughs> they can. Were you going to add something? Yeah. <laughs> so so where are we? Just I mean because time's getting late so where are we in terms of this are are we wanting to edit this are we now understanding why it is written the way that it's written and we're comfortable moving forward or do you want to um, bring this back at our next meeting I'm not comfortable with the way it is uh, I don't see the point of the change of both changes or yes. the second change both changes I don't think we, I think this is one of those things that is really, really difficult to get perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I, I guess the question I would ask is, does this get us closer to, to where we want to be? Um, so I guess my question would be from a procedural perspective. I think that's sort of what, I, what is missing for me is, is how does this get how, how does this change come to life in the schools? So what what are the what are the administrators going to do differently as a result of this, or how does this reinforce current practice? If I could get that, I think I'm I'd be comfortable with what's in here, just because again, you, this is like a dress code policy, right? You can't possibly put every piece of language in here that's going to tie up every single mm -hmm. um, possibility. So um, I, I think. If if what I'm asking for, if what I just asked for makes sense, mm -hmm. I, I would say I'd love to see it come back one more time okay. with that wrapper around it. Also, mm -hmm. has this gone out? These all went yes. out. Everything okay. that we did in the okay. summer and did you hear anything from anyone? No, I got no emails. Are they supposed to go to I think me? It was directed to Megan no, in this particular no case. Okay. Oh, really? To to share with the school committee. Okay. Well, I know she would have. So <laughs> I mean, yeah. must have not gotten anything. Um, I guess my other question to you all is. Um, the second one, bereavement or ser serious illness in the family. If in s if we struck it there but moved it down in parentheses under other exceptional reasons, so for example, serious illness in the family, not that that, so you don't want to imply that that's the only exceptional reason, but as an example, example of an exce exceptional reason, reason, would that make your comfort level higher? It, it it would and and Jean, I think it goes back to what Nancy was saying and even what John is saying. It's not so much about you know you can keep on going and try to fine tune, but we have this catch all situation right at the bottom. So I don't know why we are trying to change the language in the first place. Right. Mm. Well, I think mm. it was. I hear you. It came up because of the transition to this new student. Except I think system. I could do a better <coughs> job of giving you examples. So I, I hear all of your feedback. Okay. Does it get us closer to where we need to be? Why are we changing it? How does it reinforce, reinforce current practice? Um, I feel like I could be better prepared to answer those questions. Okay. And um, So we'll bring it back next so time. So we'll bring it back next time. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Okay, so moving along to advertising in the schools. Um, do you want to tee this up for us, yeah. Dr. McDonald? Yes, I do. Right, so this one is coming back for the second reading. You had taken, we had taken a look at it and um, had not yet shared it, but we have now. We basically moved some things around so you can look at the red line version. Mm -hmm. That second part that's red lined is not new language. It had appeared earlier in the policy. Um, and through discussion, we felt that it really belonged, that the, that the way that the policy read, that the ordering mattered. And so what you see in front of you is really cleaning up your feedback from the first time to bring back to you tonight to see if it now meets um, what you what you were hoping to get in taking up the policy to begin with? I think Jean initially it had to do with um, some of the projects, right? And future projects, and we wanted to make sure that this would would provide some good um, 
I guess, helping us in making decisions around advertising in the future. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, I think this reflects all yeah. the, the, the substantive changes we discussed last time we reviewed it, so I, I'm, I'm happy with this policy. Yes, I agree. I'm comfortable on this one. Me too. Me too. Okay. All right. All right. Wow. That was easier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so are we ready for a motion to approve policy JH as amended? I would make that motion. Okay. And a second? I would second. Very exciting. A motion by Mr. Graziano, a second by Ms. Cavanaugh. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? Okay. So that, oops, I wrote it on the wrong policy, but that passes unanimously. Um, and we are at our second opportunity for public comment where we have no members present. Audience has stayed the same. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Um, so we are now on to items by consensus. Is there anything in there that anybody wanted to pull out for separate consideration? Okay, if not, Dr. McLeod. And the superintendent recommends the school committee move to approve the items by consensus as outlined below. Okay, and a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. Um, so a motion by Ms. Devlin, a second by Mr. Graziano. All in favor? Yes. 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 Anybody opposed or abstaining? Okay. So we are ready to adjourn at 9.56. And I just need a motion. So moved. And a second? Second. Okay, so motion by Ms. Kavanaugh, second by Mr. Graziano. All in favor? Yes. 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 Anybody yes. opposed? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you all very much. We will be um, at the Board of Selectmen for a joint meeting on Tuesday, September 12th, and then our next regularly scheduled uh, school committee meeting will be September 21st at 7 o'clock back at the high school library. So thank you very much. <laughs>